All right, welcome back everybody. We're gonna move into module number two, another self-study module that we're gonna go through here, describing common TCP IP attacks. In this particular lesson, we're gonna talk about legacy TCP IP vulnerabilities to kind of understand where we're coming from. We'll talk about IP vulnerabilities that exist today from a general standpoint, and we'll look at some specific ICMP vulnerabilities, both TCP and UDP vulnerabilities, what is the attack surface and what are different attack vectors? We'll also take a look at reconnaissance attacks, different access attacks, specific man in the middle attacks. What is a denial of service attack and what is a distributed denial of service attack? We'll also talk about reflection and amplification attacks in this section. And then we'll wrap up by talking about different spoofing atta attacks, excuse me, and different DHCP attacks. And then we'll We'll conclude the, the, the lesson by going through our summary challenge. Now, TCP IP has been around for a very, very long time. As you can see here, it's RFC 793, uh, developed by the Department of Defense. Uh, but the protocols uh, that were initially identified and the, the communication methods that were initially identified were intended to be used in a secure environment, meaning that uh, the, the program, the protocols themselves weren't robust enough or weren't secure enough to be intended or, or for it, it, the intent of utilizing those protocols on the internet. Uh, it was mostly important to be able to utilize these protocols within at that secure trusted environment. Now a set of these particular protocols that we talk about is the Berkeley Remote Utilities. Uh, the Berkeley uh, System Design Unix implementation, which we simply refer to now as BSD Unix, uh, was a key component in the development of Unix operating systems at the time. Many of the innovations that began with BSD Unix are still kind of standards on Unix systems that are incorporated into our TCP IP world today. One of the um, uh, common innovations or one of the most well-known innovations of the BSD Unix platform was a set of command line utilities that were designed to provide remote access to Unix systems. Uh, these utilities were called the R utilities or R commands because the name of each utility began with R, which stood for remote. So the R utilities uh, are actually still available on Unix systems today uh, and versions of the R utilities are, are distributed with various other platforms as well. It's like OpenVMS, uh, Windows NT, Windows 2000, and other programs. Uh, but uh, even though TCP IP has become kind of more popular and more universal, uh, these utilities uh, generally have kind of uh, gone away, right? Uh, not only because of uh, other utilities that are, are more robust or more widely used or have become available, uh, but there's some inherent security risk with these particular protocols as well. Uh, our login uh, would, would be a, to a tool that would allow users to log in to a system remotely. RCP, uh, RCP was a remote copy that provided the ability to do remote file transfers. RSH uh, would allow us to execute a remote shell through the RSHD or RSH daemon. Our exec uh, execute remote commands through the our exec daemon. Uh, our, our uptime would allow us to identify system information on the number of connected users that might be connected to a particular system or the uptime of a particular system. Uh, or our who, which allows us to identify maybe possibly who was connected to the system. Uh, now, keep in mind these these R utilities were designed in the earlier and simpler days of TCP IP networking, right? Uh, the utilities were designed with the mind that only uh, trusted users would access these particular utilities. So in today's networking terms, that's not something that we typically do, right? Most administrators are going to reject the whole concept of what is a trusted user. And uh, for the most part, these utilities are generally considered far too risky for today's interconnected networks and uh, even internal networks. So we have to be very careful about how and when to use these particular utilities. Uh, more secure versions of these R utilities have been developed 
to meet the, the needs of security today. I mean, one that we use all the time, uh, SSH, Secure Shell, uh, is a remote shell application which essentially replaces RSH and our login uh, because we use encryption, because we use secure authentication. Uh, the, this protocol, and if it's implemented correctly, is considered to be kind of the modern version of RSH or our login. Uh, the R utilities themselves used a concept called trusted access. Uh, in terms of security, trusted access allows one computer to basically trust another computer's authentication. So let's say computer A and computer B are communicating. Computer A designates computer B as a trusted host, uh, and users who log into computer B can use those R, -ut R utilities to access uh, computer A without any secondary authentication. Uh, so computer A can basically say, you know what, I'm gonna designate specific users who are going to be the trusted users uh, and then that would be identified within one of the, the host files or host equivalent files on the remote machine uh, or the R host uh, file for each uh, home directory. Uh, so that's the general concept. Now obviously uh, this is a transitive trust and, and uh, that's how we identify whether or not users can execute those remote commands but again not considered to be secure by today's standards. Now something else they mentioned here is this idea of the Morse worm. Uh, in uh, November of 1988, uh, this was one of the very first worms that were distributed by the internet uh, and infected quite a few machines. I think at that time there were probably about 60,000 computers that comprised the internet at the time and, and almost 10 percent of those machines uh, 10 to 15 percent, the numbers kind of vary, uh, were actually infected with the worm itself. Uh, this actually resulted in the very first felony connection, uh, a conviction of Robert Morris under the 1986 Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Uh, so the, the worm itself was actually written by a graduate student at uh, Cornell University. His name is Robert Morris. Uh, and like I said, he launched this in November of 1988. But he launched it from computers uh, in, uh, at MIT, at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, with the hopes that somebody would suspect somebody at that, uh, at that school or that, ed uh, that educational facility uh, was responsible for propagating or installing the worm uh, and propagating it throughout the, the Internet. Uh, the original concept uh, was created by Morris just to simply see if it could be done. Um, and uh, again, it was released on, at MIT because uh, Morris was starting, studying at Cornell uh, and eventually actually Morris became a professor at MIT, which is kind of ironic. But, uh, uh, and then he um, uh, then went on to have ties to the, the uh, NSA and so on. Uh, the, the worm actually exploited uh, several different vulnerabilities to gain access to a particular system. Uh, there was a deep a hole in the debug mode of the SendMail program. Uh, there was a buffer overflow or overrun hole in the fingered network service. Uh, and then there was also the transitive trust that we discussed, which enabled people setting up things like network logins with remote execution or remote shell uh, without any sort of password requirements. All right. Uh, the worm also had some functionality to exploit weak passwords on systems as well. Um, the initial concept was, hey, I don't want this worm to be uh, actively destructive. I just want to see uh, uh, or demonstrate at least the weaknesses that are present in a lot of the computing systems at, at this time, right? At the time that this worm was released. But the, un uh, uh, the unintentional consequence of infecting thousands and thousands of computers uh, was basically uh, a coding error, right? Morris had built the code in to, to not check whether or not a computer had previously been infected, so it became a persistent worm, uh, and it would uh, continue to infect machines multiple times uh, with each additional infection slowing the machine down until the machine became unusable. So it became a denial-of-service attack. Uh, 
and uh, uh, you know crash the computer. Uh, this, I believe, uh, cost uh, uh, the, the U.S. government said anywhere from a hundred thousand to ten million dollars, uh, and um, the 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 worm itself, like I said, infected a significant number of machines. Now it only infected uh, DEC uh, Vax machines running uh, for BSD or um, you know specific types of machines but nonetheless it was um, it was definitely a, uh, a a pivotal moment in terms of network security. I think in the end he got a bunch of community service and he had to pay ten thousand or twelve thousand dollars in fines and so on. All right, so which four options are considered the main protocols of the Internet Protocol Suite? Uh, well, this is relatively straightforward in this particular case. Of course, TCP and UDP would be considered uh, parts of that, right? The user datagram protocol and the transmission control protocol. Uh, IP, uh, our layer 3 component. ICMP is also a layer 3 protocol. Uh, these all kind of fall under that TCP IP umbrella. This is actually protocol number one, believe it or not. This is protocol number uh, six and protocol number 17. Uh, so these protocols here, HTTP, SSL, FTP, and Telnet, these are all application layer protocols. HTTP runs over TCP, SSL runs over TCP, FTP runs over TCP and Telnet runs over TCP, which of course then would also run over IP. So these are more application layer protocols in this case. Now as a protocol, uh, IP has several different vulnerabilities as well. And these are well-known vulnerabilities that exist even today. Uh, inherently, the protocol itself is a relatively lightweight protocol. It's considered a connectionless protocol, so there's no active state information about the flows of information that are passing back and forth between two clients that are natively speaking IP. We rely on higher level protocols to provide that state information like TCP. Uh, but the general role of IP is to just provide end-to-end -end delivery. Uh, we really depend on the upper layer protocols to, a pro to provide for reliability, session tracking, accountability of the sessions themselves, and so on. So we, we have an addressing component at layer three that allows us to identify the sender and receiver of the information. Uh, but inherently, um, because we don't have all of these things built into the protocol itself, the protocol has some vulnerabilities. Uh, I often tell my students when we're dealing with protocols that are uh, what, what I would consider dynamic by nature, protocols like DHCP, or DNS or ARP, where there's some sort of client server transaction or some sort of uh, information gathering by sending and receiving various messages. These protocols are inherently vulnerable because of the way that they're designed. The idea, for example, of ARP, the address resolution protocol, which allows us to essentially discover the MAC address of a destination host when we only know the destination host's IP address, well, ARP is a broadcast-based protocol. And as a broadcast-based protocol, other people within the broadcast domain are gonna see those messages and they're going to make uh, a decision. Do I ignore the message because it's not intended for me? Or if I'm an evil person or an attacker, uh, then I might go ahead and, and intercept that message, uh, respond on, uh, you know, as the uh, intended recipient uh, to either poison information or spoof information that might be uh, might be received on the receiving client. SMTP is also a target for spoofing uh, because of the ability to control email messages, right? So a lot of these protocols, DHCP, uh, the dynamic trunking protocol, uh, VLAN trunking protocol, spanning tree, uh, ARP, uh, all of these protocols uh, have some vulnerabilities inherently just because of the nature of how the protocols are written. All right. And there are many, many different types of attacks that can exist. Uh, we'll go ahead and break down some of these in general, uh, and then we'll see some more specific details later on. So let's start with a man in the middle attack. 
right? A man in the middle attack, sometimes referred to as machine in the middle or person in the middle, is an attack where the attacker relays information, typically hidden. Uh, they've hidden themselves and they're, they're kind of stuck themselves into the middle of the conversation to, uh, for the intent of either simply capturing the information uh, between the two clients that think they're directly communicating with each other or even maybe possibly altering that information as the communication takes place. So we call this an eavesdropping attack, right? The attacker makes an independent connection with the victims and then it relays the messages between them to make those victims believe that they're directly communicating with each other over a secure private connection. But the reality is that that entire conversation is being controlled by the attacker. Uh, now, in order to do this, the attacker has to be able to intercept all of the messages that are passing between the two victims and maybe even possibly inject new messages. Uh, it is pretty straightforward in uh, many different situations. Um, we can use an unencrypted access point to insert ourselves into the conversation. Uh, we could use protocols like DNS and poison DNS information. Uh, so that uh, if a, a, you know, a, a victim queries a DNS destination, we can respond with the IP address of the attacker and then forward that information on. We can do this with DHCP poisoning right, uh, or DHCP spoofing where I might uh, alter the client's default gateway uh, with the intent of pointing that default gateway to the attacker uh, and so on. So there are many, many different ways to kind of, uh, uh, kind of facilitate this, this man-in-the-middle attack. Uh, now, there are also some ways of protecting against these types of attacks. The two primary methods that we have for protecting against these types of attacks is to implement some sort of robust authentication or to implement some sort of tamper detection through the use of uh, uh, message integrity or hashing processes. Uh, the authentication piece is what provides us at least some level of certainty that the message comes from a legitimate source. Uh, and as long as the uh, authentication methods or the authentication credentials that we're using are legitimate uh, and, and secure, we can have, you know, relatively... So basically any system that is going to try to secure itself against a man-in-the-middle attack has some sort of authentication method in place. Uh, we could use public key cryptography. Uh, we could also send messages over the secure channel. Uh, we have different key agreement protocols that we can use, uh, you know, to establish the security session itself. With public key infrastructure, uh, we can use protocols like TLS, transport layer security, uh, that all allow us to harden TCP transactions against man and middle attacks. We can exchange certificates, which get issued and verified by a third party. Uh, the certificate authority in this particular case uh, and the original key then can be used to authenticate uh, the CA uh, as well as the, the uh, other individual that's part of that communication process. We can do uh, HPKP, uh, HTTP public key pinning, uh, DNSSEC uh, to, to protect against DNS types of attacks or DNS man in the middle attacks and so on. We can also implement different tamper detection mechanisms. Uh, typically, uh, hash functions would be used for this. Uh, so we take a, a time to hash the data uh, and then use that hash information to verify the authenticity or the integrity, not the authenticity necessarily, although there's an authentic component to it, uh, but the integrity of the information that's being exchanged between the two parties. Now, the next thing we'll talk about is session hijacking. Uh, in the case of session hijacking, this is uh, really uh, another form of man-in-the-middle attack. Uh, we can say, for example, that Bob and Alice want to communicate to each other, and Evil Eve in the middle is doing some sort of source-routed IP packets or do, uh, performing some sort of source routing, uh, which encourages uh, both Bob and Alice to send the packets through Evil Eve's machine. Uh, the uh, source routing uh, can be done, or if source routing is disabled, the attacker could use a blind hijacking method where it guesses uh, responses of the two different machines, uh, and then the attacker could send a command 
to a to a host and maybe to influence how that host communicates it may not ever get a response but it is still kind of acting on the two victims in this particular case all right but uh, session hijacking uh, specifically if we talk about session hijacking as a uh, as a specific type of attack uh, could also refer to something that we call cookie hijacking uh, or session key uh, hijacking where we're actually gaining unauthorized access to the computer system based on the theft of the magic cookie that's used to authenticate that particular user to a remote server uh, there is one called the the pass the cookie technique for example where we actually will go through several different steps within the attack chain uh, number one we acquire the the, the cookie from the the victim's browser uh, it could be through a process dump or accessing the cookie uh, storage on the disk itself. We exfiltrate that information, uh, the, specifically the necessary authentication cookies. We open up the browser on the attacker's machine, navigate to the domain um, or the, the domain that we're trying to access. We use the developer console in this case to send the cookie uh, to the domain. Uh, and then we, uh, by, by specifying the document value or the cookie value as a key value in the UI, and then we refresh the page and we look as if we're logged in as the, uh, uh, as the victim, right? There are different mitigations, of course, uh, to protect against these types of attacks. And they, you know, most modern browsers have, uh, uh, you know, methods in place to protect against these types of attacks. Uh, but, uh, you know, we can delete our persistent cookies, uh, we can delete session cookies, uh, we can only access the session uh, cookies if we're the administrator of the machine. Uh, we can also use other cloud service transaction providers like threat detection providers, RBAC, firewalls, and so on. Uh, we can only, uh, you know, um, we can maybe even request additional authentication for proof of uh, authenticity uh, and so on. Now another type of attack is an IP address spoofing attack. Uh, and this type of attack can be utilized to perform some sort of man in the middle type of attack or it could be used simply to deny service or, or spoof a service that we're running on the network. And we typically see this in, in the context of dynamic protocols like DHCP, like DNS, like the address resolution protocol where uh, the the receiving computer sends back a response to the source spoofing the the original intended respondent uh, so that we can uh, essentially perpetrate uh, our attack based on the trusted relationship that might exist between who the original responder was supposed to be and the uh, uh, the victim of this particular type of attack all right so we, uh, we, there are legitimate reasons, of course, uh, against uh, or to have spoofing in the network, but there are many, many different uh, illegitimate uses for uh, uh, spoofing attacks. For example, you might spoof a DNS server so that you could poison DNS queries. You might spoof a DHCP server so that you can poison the configuration of the client through DHCP uh, to perpetrate maybe a man-in-the-middle attack by manipulating the default gateway that's being assigned to the client. Uh, you may spoof a uh, spanning tree uh, uh, root bridge so that you can uh, uh, effectively influence how f frames are sent through a layer two network and so on. So there are many different types of spoofing attacks. We also have uh, Mac spoofing attacks, uh, spoofed URLs at the application layer, and so on. I mean, ultimately, the whole goal of a spoofing attack is to modify the source address to either hide the identity of the sender or to impersonate another computer system on the network. Uh, in, in a lot of cases, and we'll talk about this next, this denial of service attack, but in a lot of cases, this these types of attacks are often used by uh, the, the attackers to uh, launch a distributed denial of service attack against devices. Uh, sending and receiving packets, of course, is typically the primary way that we're going to communicate in most modern networks today. 
uh, and the IP address is typically how we identify that particular individual. So uh, if a bot or if the, the attacker can, uh, can legitimately spoof uh, the source or the, the uh, source of a particular packet, we may be able to infiltrate a system or at least deny access or uh, availability of a system based on those spoof datagrams. The next one we'll talk about is a de uh, denial of service attack. Uh, in, in short, a denial of service attack is any type of attack that attacks availability. Now, the idea of a denial of service attack is not to gain access to a particular system. It's not to be able to infiltrate a system and steal information from a system. The attack is simply meant to shut down the system itself, make, making it essentially inaccessible to the users that normally would have access to that particular system. Uh, now, generally speaking, denial of service attacks are accomplished by flooding a system with a bunch of traffic or uh, triggering or sending specific types of information that would then in turn trigger that system to crash. Victims of denial of service attacks are often services or, or, or destinations that have kind of an open nature, for example, a web server. Uh, but it could be a web server for a high profile client, a banking customer, a, a, an e-commerce customer, a media company, a government agency, and so on. But the idea of the denial of service attack is to bring the system to a point where it's not functioning. The denial of service attacks typically don't result in any kind of theft or loss of significant information on the asset itself, uh, but it stood, could still cost a company uh, uh, money and time in, in mitigating that particular threat, but it also could affect the overall reputation of the organization. There are two general methods of denial of service attacks, uh, flat, uh, flooding services or crashing services. Uh, a flood attack occurs when basically the system receives just too much information or too much traffic sent to the server and the server doesn't have the ability to process that information or buffer that information which causes that system to slow down and eventually stop working. A uh, buffer overflow attack is really kind of the most common denial of service attack that we see today. The concept of a buffer overflow attack is to send more traffic to the particular destination than the system is designed to handle. Uh, and uh, it does include several different types of attacks. A buffer overflow attack is really kind of just a general description, but it could be an ICMP flooding attack where I send a bunch of spoofed packets of pings to the computer uh, to overwhelm the computer. Uh, this could be a, a, a smurf attack or a ping of death. I can do a TCP send flood attack where I'm sending a whole bunch of TCP SYN requests to a computer. Uh, that computer is then responding with SYN acts based on the availability of that particular port. Uh, but if I can send enough of those uh, and continue to open up ports, I will essentially starve out that, that particular computer. All right? Uh, uh, or, or, or at least prevent that computer, computer from being able to open up any additional new TCP sessions with legitimate clients. Other denial of service attacks really just exploit vulnerabilities that cause the system to crash itself. If the system is not running, if the system's not functioning, that is technically denial of service. Uh, we may take input data, uh, send it to the, the system, uh, and then based on a bug or a vulnerability of the target system, will cause the system to destabilize and eventually crash. All right. Now, uh, another type of attack is a distributed denial of service attack. We're gonna talk about that and, and, oops, sorry about that. We'll talk about that and then we'll also talk about resource exhaustion attacks as well. Uh, a distributed denial of service attack is a, uh, a different type of denial of service attack where multiple systems synchronize the denial of service attack from different attack vectors to attack, uh, to attack an, uh, a single target or to attack a single system. The uh, difference here is that instead of being attacked from one individual location, which generally is relatively easy to identify, 
as malicious, relatively easy to, to identify as a targeted attack, will distribute that attack across thousands or tens of thousands of computers. Number one, we can leverage those computers and provide a greater volume of, of uh, information to attack the, the computer itself. The location of the attack is very, very difficult to identify because of the, the random distribution of the attacking systems themselves. It's more difficult to shut down the attack if it's coming from multiple vectors. Uh, and it is actually kind of difficult to identify. Uh, I mean, it would be relatively easy to see anomalous behavior if, if one client is generating 10,000 TCP send requests uh, from a single source. But if I have one SIN request coming from 10,000 clients, that would be much, much more difficult to identify as an attack uh, because it's not uncommon for a single client to send a single TCP request. The last one is the resource exhaustion attack. This could be um, a scenario where uh, it's a, an attack against availability. Uh, so let's say a perfect example is a DHCP server. Uh, the DHCP server is handing out IP addresses to clients, uh, but there's a limited number of addresses within the pool of DHCP addresses. So uh, in that regard, if I can go ahead and send a bunch of spoofed DHCP discover messages and go through the process of acknowledging the DHCP process, uh, if I can do that enough times over a short period of time, I could ex essentially exhaust the amount of DHCP addresses that exist in that pool and then legit, a legitimate clients uh, will not be able to get access to uh, DHCP information. Uh, that's just one example. We could take up all the memory on a computer. We could take up the CPU cycles on a computer. Network bandwidth, if we're, if we're just sending large amounts of datagrams over a, over a particular link, so just to simply saturate the link with a bunch of traffic. So there, there anything that would essentially result in the oversubscription or overutilization of a resource within the network would be considered a, a type of resource exhaustion attack. Which IP attack type is a simultaneous coordinated attack from multiple source machines? Uh, we just talked about that uh, distributed denial of service attack. By the way, how are these DDoS attacks usually facilitated? How do we actually get all these different computers to perform the attack? Do I have to, as, a, as an attacker, do I have to set up uh, a bunch of my own personal computers to launch these attacks? No. What I do is I set up a botnet. Uh, a botnet is a, uh, a group of computers uh, that belong to individuals uh, that are not uh, typically part of my uh, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily own those computers or I don't necessarily uh, uh, have uh, full control of those computers, but we have these internet connected devices. They're running some sort of bot application on them and, uh, and then we can, we can use these botnets to launch these different attacks. Uh, we control the botnet using a command and control server uh, and the idea here is that we've got all these computers that are acting as as kind of a, uh, a tool for us as the attacker uh, to, to launch the attack. So some sort of malware or some sort of virus was installed on the computer to get it to participate in this particular botnet. Uh, and then based on that, we were able to launch that, uh, launch that attack from multiple, uh, multiple sources, if you will. All right, the core components of the botnet is uh, the botnet originator, that's going to be the bot master, uh, and then it's going to be the one that's controlling the botnet remotely. So we have different control protocols, uh, typically with IRC or some sort of uh, IRC based application. We can modify SMTP implementations. Uh, we have the zombie computers themselves. Those are the ones that are connected to the internet that have been compromised by the hacker. Uh, with a virus or a Trojan uh, to, to, to uh, then uh, join that computer to the botnet and then using some sort of uh, remote software, we can then have those computers spread email spam, launch denial of service attacks, uh, and so on. In fact, many different 
of these computers that are part of the botnet, these zombie computers, don't even realize that they are even compromised. They don't even realize they're participating in this, in this particular uh, uh, botnet. Uh, some of the command and control protocols, uh, Telnet, uh, IRC, Internet Relay Chat, peer-to-peer uh, -peer protocols, DNS or domain information, uh, and so on. So uh, the, the hacker builds a Trojan, an exploit kit, starts infecting computers uh, that, that uh, with this malicious application, those computers become uh, part of the bot the botnet, I should say, the bot then instructs that infected computer to take uh, 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 or to connect to the command and control server, uh, and then we can we can identify how many computers are part of the botnet, how many computers have been infected, uh, and then we use those bots to gather things like keystrokes, to steal credentials, to launch attacks, uh, and uh, generally speaking, these are relatively widespread. Um, you know, some of the common uh, botnets, uh, I would say probably uh, Conficker was one of the most robust ones. Uh, it infected over 10 million computers. Uh, the uh, Brito Lab uh, effect infected over 30 million computers. Uh, we had some other ones as well that were relatively robust. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of those are those were kind of one of the some of the larger ones. I mean, we did have Mariposa, which was about 12 to 15 million computers, I believe. Um, but for the most part, most of these botnets are tens of thousands of computers, or or hundreds of thousands of computers. Kraken, for example, 490 or 500,000 computers, uh, and so on. So uh, there have been some. Some recent ones, I think the, the, the last major one was in around 2014 or 2015. Um, but uh, we, we do have mitigation techniques in place and countermeasures in, in place to protect against these uh, subversions and so on. All right, let's move into the next piece here. We'll talk about uh, vulnerabilities with the Internet Control Messaging Protocol. Uh, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about different types of vulnerabilities that exist within this connectionless protocol. Uh, it is part of the Internet Protocol Suite. Uh, it's used by various network devices to basically send uh, reachability messages, error messages, uh, operational information that would basically indicate the success or the failure when we're communicating with another IP address uh, you know, or a host that we're trying to reach on a particular network and it might provide us information about whether or not that host is reachable. Uh, ICMP is a lot different than transport protocols like TCP or UDP in that the systems do not actually, uh, it's not a protocol that's actually used to exchange data between systems. Uh, it is a protocol that allows us the ability to troubleshoot and verify reachability of systems and and uh, to perform tasks like path verification and so on. Uh, we do have diagnostic tools like ping and traceroute. Uh, ICMP has been around for quite some time. It was actually defined in RFC 792. Uh, ICMP v6 is a little bit later, RFC 4443. But the idea here is that the protocol itself is just basically part of the overall internet protocol suite. ICMP messages themselves are typically used for things like diagnostic or control purposes, or they're generated in response to errors in general IP operations. An example of these operations would be, well, would be where the IP datagram uh, has a, proto a field within it. In IPv6, we call it the uh, hop limit field. In IPv4, we call it the time to live field. But that field typically will get decremented by one for each layer three device that the packet passes through. And if the end result is that the time to live or the next uh, or the uh, uh, hop limit field reaches a value of zero, that packet is going to be dropped. And then some sort of ICMP time exceeded message is going to be sent in that particular case. We also have other utilities like traceroute uh, that we can use to manipulate those IP TTL fields or uh, um, hop limit fields 
looking for the specific ICMP time exceeded messages so that we can identify different hops along the path. The ICMP header uh, starts with the basic IPv4 header or IPv6 header, followed by protocol number one or protocol type number one. And then the ICMP packets themselves have an eight byte header with a variable sized data portion. The first four bytes of the IP header are fixed, while the last four uh, uh, bytes depend really on the, the type code itself of, uh, or the type or code of that particular ICMP packet. All right, and we'll talk about, you know, a, a little bit about this. We're not gonna get into this in a lot of detail because our focus here is really on what are some of the vulnerabilities with the protocol itself, but we do have different control messages. We have different subtypes, what we call uh, ICMP codes. Uh, we have a checksum field, and then we have other information. Now the data field itself uh, contains the data section that includes a, a copy of the entire IPv4 header, plus at least the first eight bytes of data from the v4 packet that caused that particular error message, which gives us an overall packet length of 576 bytes. That data is what's going to be used by the host to match the messages to the appropriate process that's being processed by the application. And for example, if a higher level protocol uses port numbers, those port numbers would probably be listed within the first eight bytes of the original datagram's data field, all right? Now it is the very nature of these variable sizes of ICMP packet data sections that, are be, that, that would be potentially exploited. The ping of death, for example, uh, which results in large or fragmented ICMP packets, which could be used to, to, to perpetrate some sort of denial of service attack and so on. IP, uh, ICMP data, the, the data field could also be used to create what we call covert channels for communication, which we refer to simply as ICMP tunnels. A covert channel is really just a way for us to uh, create an attack that uh, transfers information between the hosts that are involved in the process uh, that would normally not be able to allow, not would be, would normally that communication would not be permitted based on security policies that we might have in place and whatnot. The control messages themselves are identified uh, based on a value in the type field. There's a code field that gives additional content about the ICMP messages specifically. Uh, so for example, uh, zero is a type of echo reply, uh, and that's used in a ping, a one and a two is reserved. We have destination unreachable as a type, and then we have a, a whole bunch of different codes within destination unreachable. Uh, maybe a port is unreachable, that, uh, unreachable, that would be a code of three. Uh, the host is unknown would be a code of seven. Uh, the type of service is not supported, uh, that'd be a code of 12 and so on. Uh, we're not going to get into all of the specific fields uh, based on the fact that the destination is unreachable, but surely you would be able to go out and reference that information online uh, if you want to see those specific codes. Uh, we also have a source quench, which has been somewhat deprecated. That would be a type of four. A redirect message uh, would be a redirect from the host or for that particular host or for the network itself based on the toss byte uh, and so on. Uh, uh, echo request is a, is a type of eight. Uh, 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 router advertisement is a type of nine. A router solicitation is a type of 10 and so on. So again, our goal here is not to talk about the format and the structure of ICMP specifically. Uh, we have many, many other types uh, and they, they go all the way, it's an eight bit field so technically those types can go all the way up to 255, uh, but you know most of the types are going to be below 50, uh, is is what's already uh, kind of presently defined. All right, so we're not going to talk about what a source quench is in this particular case. We're not talking about what a redirect is and so on. Our goal here is to really talk about what are the security issues that exist with ICMP that we need to be concerned with when we're talking about this particular protocol within our enterprise. Now, certainly one of the most basic concepts would be a reconnaissance or scanning types of attacks. ICMP can be used as a very lightweight 
uh, non-connection oriented or connectionless protocol to launch different types of scanning attacks or uh, some sort of uh, uh, you know network enumeration or host enumeration attacks that would exist on the network. Now, typically when we do talk about different types of attacks here, I'm going to kind of go through these ones here briefly, uh, but I'm not going to necessarily go in this order because different types of attacks within the ICMP protocol suite have different objectives, right? So one basic form of an attack would be some sort of reconnaissance or scanning type of attack where we're not trying to actually break into a particular system, we're not trying to gain access to a system, but we're trying to enumerate the network or identify systems that exist in, uh, in the network itself. So an ICMP sweep, for example. Uh, and, and, you know, really with any type of attack scenario, the first thing is to engage in some sort of reconnaissance and scanning activities, right? We want to understand the environment of the target, we want to gather information about the target so that we can plan our attack approach. And then we want to have the right techniques and tools for subsequent attacks that we want to implement on the network. And the most common, even though it is very, very uh, chatty, if you will, it will generate a lot of traffic, is uh, discovering a range of hosts that are basically alive in the environment by simply doing an ICMP sweep of the entire network. All right. An ICMP sweep is basically just sending out a bunch of ICMP request packets to the target network uh, or a range of networks. Uh, and then based on the list of ICMP, uh, ICMP replies that we receive, uh, we can identify whether certain hosts are alive or connected to that particular network so that we can then now uh, essentially use that information to, to then target those individual hosts. All right, this, this attack could be done manually. We could just do a basic ping, but there's a lot of different automated tools that are available, Network Mapper, SuperScan, uh, that kind of automate that process and, and allow us to scan all possible IP addresses within a given network. All right, another tool that's useful to us that we also like to use uh, for basic troubleshooting is Traceroute. It's a very, very useful tool for mapping out the target network configuration uh, and uh, you know basically what this command essentially does is it sends out a progressive series of packets with an increasing time to live value set in the TTL field or in the uh, hop limit field and then when an interme intermediate device or router receives a forwarding packet it's going to decrement that TTL value of that packet before forwarding it on to the next router. Uh, now, if that value of the packet or if that value of that field reaches zero, we send an ICMP time exceeded message back to the originating host. By sending the packet with that initial TTL value of one, it will allow that first router in the path of the packet to send back that time exceeded message, which then allows the attacker to know the IP address of the first router in the network. And then subsequent packets are sent with an increasing time to live value uh, in that packet by one each time, and then the attacker is going to be able to know every hop between them and the target. Uh, using this particular method will also give the attacker not only trace and path information that was taken by the packet as it travels to the overall target, but it gives information on the topology of the target network itself. And this is really, really critical in order for the attacker to plan their particular approach when they want to attack a network. Uh, there are several different network mapping tools that are available. Uh, CHEOPS or C-H-E-O-P-S uh, is, a, is a, a, a val, uh, you know, one of those tools uh, that allows the attacker to basically quickly map out the entire target network using both the ping and the traceroute tool. Uh, it is a very noisy tool from traffic perspective. If you have IPSs or, or IDSs and firewall logs in the network that you are monitoring, uh, it is possible, of course, to be able to identify that this is occurring. One of the uh, attacks that they, uh, they identify here is a firewall attack, right? Uh, so this is kind of developed based on that original traceroute idea. 
uh, which uh, Firewalk is used to identify ports that are open on a packet filtering firewall. Now the purpose of doing this is to really map out the filtering rules that are being set up at the packet filtering firewall. Remember, we're talking about stateless packet filtering in this particular case. Firewalking is typically done in two different phases. Phase one involves doing a trace route from the attacker to the eventual target firewall to identify the number of hops that it will take for a packet to reach that particular firewall. And during that particular scanning phase, the TTL value of the packets are gonna be set up one greater than the firewall, and we're gonna send those packets to a known host behind the firewall. If we get an ICMP time exceeded message, that would mean that the packet has managed to get past the firewall causing the ICMP packet to be returned with a, uh, by the known host because the TTL value was actually uh, decremented to zero. Otherwise, it could be kind of inferred or at least deduced that there was some sort of fire filtering rule on the firewall which stopped that particular traffic flow. All right. Uh, inverse mapping is another technique that can be used with ICMP. Uh, it's basically used to map internal networks or hosts that are protected by a filtering device. Usually some of those systems are not reachable from the internet. So we use routers, which will give us uh, a way internally uh, within the internal architecture. Uh, well, ultimately it's just gonna give us information of the network. Even if the question they were asked doesn't really make sense, for the type of scanning that we might be doing on the network. Our goal is to compile a list of IPs that list what is not there and use that to conclude other things that are probably there, if that makes sense. That's why it's referred to in this particular case as, uh, as inverse mapping. So typically step one, uh, as an attacker, I would send an ICMP reply message to a bunch of IP uh, uh, addresses that are behind the, the, the filtering device or the felt firewall itself. Once receiving those ICMP reply messages, since the filtering device doesn't keep state information of ICMP requests, it would or possibly could allow those packets to reach their destination. If there is an internal router, the router will respond typically with a host unreachable for every host that it cannot reach, giving you the attacker the knowledge of all the hosts that are present behind the, the firewall or the filtering device in this particular case. Another type of attack would be an OS fingerprinting attack. Uh, before any typical attack is launched, other than knowing that the host exists, it is probably, as you guys can infer, extremely beneficial to understand what the underlying operating system is, as well as the list of services that a particular host might run. Now, port scanners can determine the types of services that are being offered by a particular system, but ICMP could be engaged in helping the attacker determine what the underlying operating system is. The difference with other scanning tools and the advantage of using ICMP in a OS fingerprinting exercise, it gives the attacker a more stealthy way uh, of performing the OS identification. In some instances, only a single packet actually gets sent to figure out what the operating system uh, is uh, employed or what operating system is being used on the, the, the victim system or the target system, all right? Uh, the, the whole concept here is that we're, we're exploiting the fact that different operating system vendors have built a different way of handling network traffic. Uh, and by, by looking at that characteristic, looking at how those operating systems handle that network traffic, we're able to essentially fingerprint or identify uh, those operating systems. So maybe we send a UDP packet where we have a DF bit set uh, uh, to a target host whose, whose particular UDP port is closed. And I might get a destination unreachable port message that gets returned to the attacker. 
due to the fact that different hosts will have different types of ICMP packets or they'll, they'll actually send different types of ICMP packets back, we can determine by examining bits in those return packets what the operating system is. For example, if we look at the precedence field of a packet and the value is 0x Charlie 0, uh, then the up underlying operating system is most likely going to be a Linux kernel uh, 2.0 or 2.2 or 2.4 based machine or possibly a Cisco based router or an extreme networks switch. All right. Now, in this particular instance, we still have some ambiguity. So to differentiate between a Linux kernel and that of, say, a Cisco device or an extreme device, we can look at the ICMP error quoting size fingerprinting method. Uh, and in this method, the ICMP packet that we get back gets inspected for the number of bytes that are actually being returned. A Linux kernel will return a different number of bytes compared to a network device. Uh, and so we're able to further differentiate those, uh, those hosts. Uh, another step that we can use to differentiate with various versions of a Linux is looking at the IP uh, TTL value set within the packet. For example, Linux uh, 2.0 has an initial value of 64, where 2.2 and 2.4 are going to use an initial value of 255. All right, we can also differentiate even between 2.2 and 2.4 if you look at the IP ID value of the packet. 2.4.1, for example, through 2.4.4 has a value that equals zero, but not 2.2.x, right? Any version of 2.2. So just by looking at one of the return packets from the target, I'm able to drill down and type and identify the version of the underlying operating system because of these fingerprints, because of these characteristics. Thankfully, we don't really need to know how all these things work. Typically, we can use a tool like Xprobe or some sort of Kali Linux platform tool to be able to enumerate hosts and networks, but we're essentially taking advantage of the nature of the protocol and how these operating systems were written to be able to identify specific things about that particular operating system. So those are basically the scanning and reconnaissance aspects of ICMP. What about the exploitation of systems? Uh, they actually mentioned the third one down here, ICMP redirects. So an ICMP route redirect message is sent whenever a gateway receives IP traffic from a host and finds that destination in its routing table that the uh, that its next gateway to be routed for this traffic is on the same network as the particular host. Uh, so let me explain what I mean by that. So it, it doesn't really, uh, before I get into that, let me just say it doesn't, you know, when you look at this at first, it doesn't really reveal any particular problem. But let's go through a scenario to see how we could actually exploit this information to allow a man-in-the-middle attack to be launched, right? So let's say, for example, an attacker manages to take over a, uh, a gateway, a secondary gateway of the source host. Maybe we have two different gateways that exist within the enterprise or on the segment, whatever it might be, but I've managed to take over a secondary gateway of the source host. I send a TCP open packet to the source host acting as a particular destination host. So while the, uh, a reply is in transit for the sort host, source host to the destination host through this second gateway, the attacker sends an ICMP route redirect message to the source host, spoofing that second gateway. The source host is gonna then accept the route change control message as valid because it's coming from a gateway that's identified and changes its routing table to now route all of the traffic that's bound for the destination host through gateway number one, right? Now keep in mind, I'm the attacker. I already took over gateway number one. And as an attacker, I basically sent a message to the source host uh, acting as the destination or spoofing the destination saying, hey, uh, while, uh, 
you know, what, if you're going to send traffic to me, go ahead and send traffic to gateway number one. Now the attacker uh, can read or modify those messages. They can forward traffic that's bound for that uh, actual destination to gateway two, uh, acting as essentially the man in the middle host, hopefully to maintain their connectivity. All right. Uh, we see some other types of attacks here, um, but let's talk about some other. There are some that are not listed here, which I think are really, really important to discuss as well as far as exploitation goes. What about informational messages themselves? If I send an oversized ICMP message to a target host, it could potentially crash or reboot that individual host. Uh, some operating systems actually don't know how to handle packets that are larger than the maximum size that were identified within the RFC for ICMP. All right, now the specification allows for 65,536 bytes in a single packet of information. So this exploit can easily be done through the use of a ping command using a flag to indicate the size of the packet to be sent uh, and we simply set it to a value that's greater than 65,536 bytes. And then the operating system might check on the size of the outgoing packet and it might say, well, we're not gonna allow that to happen. That would be a good protection mechanism that, to put in place, but there are lots of tools that, that you can download uh, to customize uh, ping packets. I mean, it, 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 the operating system might not allow it to happen if I'm using switches within a command line ping, but if I download HPing2 or some other tool, uh, it may not uh, limit that capability, all right? Now, if the target system isn't pre uh, properly secured or patched, it could cause the operating system to freeze or reboot uh, just by sending one oversized packet. Most operating systems are kind of protected against this at this point, but that is, uh, that is a, a different type of attack, right? But if we can exploit the nature of fragmentation as well uh, as oversized packets, there is another type of exploit that's possible that causes operating systems to stop responding or to have some sort of reboot or, or whatever to recover from the, from, the, uh, from the attack. SSPing is a good tool for that. Uh, Jolt2 is another good tool. Uh, and both of these send large numbers of, of identical uh, fragmented packets to the, to the victim. Uh, and then that causes that particular host to stop responding for a period of time while the attack is in progress. Uh, Teardrop is another tool that's useful as well to send a stream of fragmented packets to a target host to ask them to put them back together. So I'm gonna send you a bunch of fragments and I'm gonna instruct you as a target host to put a bunch of these packets back together. When that particular host tries to do something like that, uh, the, the packets are not the right size, uh, they're not the size that they say they are, and then the host uh, hangs or reboots uh, based on that, all right? We can also do ICMP router discoveries. Uh, before a host is able to send a message to any host outside of its own subnet, it has to be able to identify the address of the gateway of its immediate router on the subnet. And this is typically done through reading uh, a, a, you know, a configuration file, uh, when the device boots up, or it could be done through multicast, or it's done through the assignment of uh, gateway through DHCP and so on. But we also have a protocol called, and it's an extension of ICMP called the ICMP Router Discovery Protocol. And it's able to use something called a router advertisement with a router solicitation message to allow the hosts in the network to find out the IP address of the router that's attached to their immediate network. So when the host is starting up, it's gonna make all these different router solicitation messages uh, to check the IP address of the immediate router. But since these messages are not authenticated, really anybody can spoof these messages or otherwise uh, you know, uh, take over that particular process. All right, so a host boots up, maybe it issues a router solicitation message to find out who is the default router on this network. I'm the attacker, I'm listening for those messages and I spoof a reply on behalf of that particular host. 
uh, the default route of the host is now set to my IP address as the attacker. And then I simply employ sniffing or man in the middle attacks for all the traffic that goes through that particular IP address. Uh, we could also simply use this as a denial of service attack because we could just simply say, well, we're not going to forward any of the packets uh, that are coming to this, uh, to this IP address. All right. There are many, many other types of attacks. Another type of attack would be an ICMP flood. Uh, we just simply, it's more of a denial of service attack, but we just simply flood the target with a whole bunch of ICMP messages that basically leaves the attacked host uh, with degraded performance or uh, in, in a lot of cases resulting in some sort of denial of service. Uh, a Smurf attack, um, they basically use the whole network of computers to send a bunch of traffic to a victim's machine on the network. In fact, let's take a look at that right here. All right, we're talking about different denial of service attacks in this particular case, specifically the ICMP flood, or in this case, the Smurf attack. Let me scroll down to that image here. All right, talk about the Smurf attack. So basically the attacker finds some network uh, that's gonna to respond to the broadcast address of the subnet. Now, a lot of times this is blocked or it's not, it's not achievable in the network. Uh, because it's being blocked by different security mechanisms that we have in place. But let's say that we were able to identify a network that was able to do this. We spoof the IP address of the victim and send a number of ICMP echo request packets to the broadcast address of that intermediate network. Now, what's going to end up happening is uh, everybody that's within that network wants to respond to that message because it was a broadcast message which instructs those clients to respond, and then they are going to send their response to the victim, the spoofed IP address of the victim. So you're gonna get a whole bunch of ICMP echo replies that go to the victim, uh, and then that would uh, result in some sort of denial of service. All right? Now, as always, we want to, uh, oh, once we've you know uh, done an attack or, or perpetrated some sort of attack, want to make sure we keep access and cover our tracks. So we compromise the system. We can hide our information being transmitted across the network by using tunneling. Tunneling is another method. So we can tunnel protocols inside of another protocol. Loki2 is a protocol that does this. It uses ICMP and UDP tunneling to create a reverse shell from the attacked system. So the attacker gets root access on the victim's computer. It gets Loki2 and it compiles it on the machine. Then we launch the Loki2 client on the attacking machine and we get a reverse shell into the victim's computer. Now I have shell access to the victim's computer while tunneling traffic through normal ICMP data packets. Okay, The traffic that's actually being exchanged between the Loki client and the Loki server is almost covert. There are no listening ports open on the victim's machine and the traffic could even be encrypted with an encryption algorithm, something like Diffie-Hellman or Blowfish or something like that uh, and so on. So, you know, we talk about all these different types of attacks uh, in this particular example. Uh, there's the flooding attack, different denial of service attacks, ICMP uh, op uh, operating system fingering and so on. Um, but again, the idea here is that we're using a protocol uh, that was designed to be lightweight uh, and very easy to use and taking advantage of those characteristics and using them for attacks on the network. Which information can an attacker use with an ICE, with, uh, within uh, the ICMP, the Internet Control Messaging Protocol, to determine which type of operating system is running? Now, in our particular case, it's most likely going to be, well, we can, we can identify a couple of these here, but the total length of the packet, probably not going to be one of our choices here. Uh, definitely the TTL value would be something to consider. Absolutely. The version wouldn't matter. Checksum wouldn't matter in this particular case. So in this case, the TTL would be our choice. Which option is used to establish a covert connection between two remote computers using ICMP echo requests and reply packets, and which can be used to bypass firewall rules. 
Uh, well, um, we can identify firewall rules using firewalking. Sm Smurf attack is just a denial of service attack. We talked about that as part of our discussion here. But uh, firewalking is, uh, it allows us to maybe potentially identify rules. But it's actually the ICMP tunneling that will give us the opportunity to, to create that tunnel and bypass those particular firewall rules in this particular case. All right. All right. Now, let's talk about TCP, and we'll get into UDP as well. TCP uh, uh, is a transport layer protocol. It allows us to transport information across the network, uh, but it has a lot more functionality, a lot more characteristics built into it, uh, of course, at the cost of more overhead to provide things like connection establishment, reliability, flow control mechanisms, all of the stateful communications that we typically look for. It has the ability to do sequencing and acknowledgements. We have the ability to identify what type of traffic is, is uh, flowing and what application layer information exists based on port numbers and so on. Uh, there's acknowledgements that guarantee delivery. Uh, there's retransmissions. There's uh, uh, flow control mechanisms like windowing uh, to allow us to identify how quickly, uh, how much information should be sent before an acknowledgement is received and so on. Uh, but TCP is a very uh, is a is defined as a stateful protocol. We can take advantage of that stateful nature to launch different types of attacks. We can also take advantage of that stateful behavior to be able to identify uh, maybe vulnerabilities in a particular communications channel, or to simply take over a communications channel based on that based on that information. Now, the first type of attack that we talk about here is an attack that takes advantage of really the nature of the protocol itself. We call this a TCP SYN flood attack. Now, TCP SYN flood attack is a type of DOS, a type of distributed uh, or, or denial of service attack or distributed denial of service. And the whole idea of this particular type of attack is that we're taking advantage of what the device is designed to do, right? By default, a server or a communication device on the network that's providing a particular service will have open ports. And those open ports will allow us to identify uh, how we can establish communication channels with legitimate hosts. So, for example, a web server is, might have port 80 open or it might have port 443 open or an FTP server might have port 20 or 21 open and so on. And the idea here is that the server is going to listen for a TCP SYN request on that particular port uh, to be able to identify, uh, hey, I'm, uh, I'm able to communicate with you on this particular port. And uh, as the progression of the communication goes, I'll send a SYN ACK uh, acknowledging your desire to communicate with me. And ultimately, you would send a final ACK indicating that we're now able to open or uh, establish that connection. But with a SYN flood attack or a TCP SYN flood attack, I don't acknowledge that final acknowledgement. I don't send that final acknowledgement. So we have a whole bunch of half open uh, connections which consume the resources on the system to the, to the point, hopefully, but at least this is the attacker's goal, to make that system unresponsive to legitimate traffic. So the packet uh, that the attacker sends is that initial spoof send packet, uh, which is again used as part of the three-way handshake. That's the synchronization message. The server acknowledges this request by sending the SYNAC back to the client. The client responds with an ACK normally. That's what would happen. And then the connection would be established. Uh, this is what we refer to simply as the TCP three-way handshake. And it's really the foundation of every TCP-based connect, uh, connection. Uh, it you know, really, it's a very simple, simple type of attack. A SYN flood attack works by simply not responding to the server with that expected ACK code. Uh, and then we, uh, you know, we could spoof various source IP addresses. Uh, we could actually get the server to send SYN ACKs to, uh, a, 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 you know, a different address uh, because, uh, uh, you know, that client might not then respond because it says, you know what, I never sent you a SYN request. Why are you sending me a SYN ACK? Uh, but the point is that the server is going to wait 
for that final acknowledgement for a pretty long period of time, which would uh, really just cause that, uh, because they might, you know, the server might say, well, maybe it's taking a while for the act to come in or whatever, but we have these half open connections created by the malicious uh, attacker, which binds all the resources on the server. And eventually, uh, if we can do enough of them, we'll exceed the resources that are available on that particular server. And then the server would not be able to respond to legitimate uh, clients themselves. Now, there are uh, a number of, of countermeasures that are available. Uh, we could uh, do some sort of filtering. We can do increasing uh, backlog. Uh, we could reduce the send receive timer, uh, recycle those old half open TCP connections, use send cookies, uh, firewalls, and proxies, and so on. But it's a really, really basic type of attack which takes advantage of what the device is going to, was intended to do in the first place. You'll find that a lot of different denial of service attacks are like this. A denial of service attack is simply an attack that takes advantage of what a system is designed to do in the first place. Now, another type of attack that exists within TCP is this idea of session hijacking, right? TCP guarantees delivery of the data. Uh, it also guarantees that the packet will be delivered in the same order that they're typically sent. And in order to guarantee that packets are delivered in the right order, we use a series of acknowledgments and sequence numbers to create this, what we call a full duplex reliable stream connection between two different endpoints uh, that are communicating to each other. So after that three-way handshake, it's just a matter of really sending packets and incre incrementing that sequence number to verify that the packets are being sent and received. Now the goal of a TCP session hijacker is to create a state where the client and server are, are unable to exchange data. That would enable the attacker to forge acceptable packets for both ends, which mimic the real packets themselves. So the attacker, the overall goal in this particular case is that for them to be able to gain access to that particular session. IP spoofing is a technique that we use to gain unauthorized access to computers where I send a message to a computer with the IP address indicating that the message came from some sort of trusted host. We could also do a man in the middle attack where we gain access to a session by doing some sort of ARP spoofing or some other man in the middle attack. We can do blind hijacking. Uh, uh, where we, uh, you know, maybe source routing uh, is disabled and we can, we can use uh, blind hijacking where we inject the malicious data into our intercepted communication. Uh, the only reason it's called blind in this particular case, uh, we can send data, but we don't usually get a response in this particular case. Uh, so we, we have some limitations on the types of responses that we can get. So again, the, the, the goal here is uh, really to overtake an active session between two individual hosts. Uh, and like I said, there are many, many different ways that we can do this. The example that they use in the book uh, is based on a, um, uh, uh, the concept of spoofing. Uh, so the sequence numbers get exchanged during that three-way handshake. Host A sends a SIN uh, packet or a SIN segment with the send bit uh, set uh, and a initial sequence number to host B to establish that particular session. That sequence number is what we're going to use for the transmission of pa packets from that point forward. It's typically gonna be based on the number of bytes that we're sending in the stream. Uh, and then of course the acknowledgements are always gonna be acknowledging what you expect to receive next. So if I send you a thousand bytes of data, Maybe the sequence number is 1,000, you're going to, have to acknowledge 1,001, and so on. It's not quite that simple, but it's, it's very similar to that process. So the first sequence number that we use typically for security purposes is actually random in this particular case. We don't always just simply start with sequence number one. Host B, on the other hand, will reply with a packet that has a SIN and an ACK bit set. That's part of the three-way handshake but it's also gonna contain an initial sequence number as well, what we call the ISN, uh, and an acknowledgement number. And again, with TCP, we always acknowledge 
the next byte of data that we expect to receive, or at least the next sequence of information we expect to receive. Uh, and then host A will reply with its final acknowledgement with those ISNs as well. If I'm able to predict what those initial sequence numbers are, I might actually be able to intercept that traffic or even reply on behalf, uh, on behalf of the original host by spoofing that original host and then hijack that particular TCP connection. So if we have a system, and older operating systems were notorious for this, if we had a system that had uh, poor TCP ISN generation, uh, then it would be highly vulnerable to spoofing attacks. Uh, we could make a full connection to that system. Uh, we could do blind spoofing, like I said, where we can send data to the system but not receive it, uh, uh, which would allow us to do things like um, our login or remote shell connections and so on. Uh, but the idea here is that we're communicating with that host. Now, hijacking a TCP session does require the attacker uh, to send packets uh, with the right sequence number. Otherwise, those packets will simply be ignored. All right, uh, if they don't match what the target system was supposed to receive, uh, then, then, it's, uh, then it's basically gonna be ignored as a malformed packet. Now, they do mention in the book here a couple of different options. We've got blind, non-blind spoofing versus blind spoof. Now, in short, non-blind spoofing basically takes place when the attacker and the destination are on the same subnet. Uh, by being on the same subnet, I might be able to use things like packet capture utilities to get sequence numbers for a particular type of attack. Blind spoofing takes place when the attacker is not on the same subnet as the destination. So obtaining the correct TCP sequence numbers is a lot more difficult in this particular case, but we can use things like IP source routing uh, to determine what those sequence numbers are. All right, the idea is the attacker needs to be able to guess or predict the correct TCP sequence numbers, and that will in turn uh, uh, depend on uh, what type of attacking uh, that we're actually launching in this particular case. If I'm launching a remote IP spoofing attack with source routing, I, I can use this feature called IP source routing to specify the complete routing path to be taken by two different endpoints. And typically this is not gonna be allowed in most networks. Uh, it's relatively uh, difficult to implement because of the, the basic security features that exist in a particular network. Uh, but if the attacker is on a different subnet than the destination, if I send a packet with a source route specified in the IP header, it causes the destination host to send the traffic back to the spoofed IP address through the route that was specified. Uh, and then we were able to get information about that particular packet flow. Uh, source routing has actually two different variations. We can do loose source routing or we can do strict source routing. Loose store, uh, with loose source routing, the attacker gives a list of IP addresses uh, th that the packet has to travel through, but the packet could also travel through additional routers along the path, uh, but it has to go through these specific IPs, but it could possibly go through some other IPs along the way. With strict uh, IP source routing, the, the packet can only pass through the, the list of IP addresses that, there, that were specified by the attacker itself. All right, now, if an attacker is on the same subnet as the target system, they could launch a man-in-the-middle attack. Uh, one variant of the man-in-the-middle attack is where the attacker convinces the systems to send frames through the attacker's PC. So if I could send a series, for example, of gratuitous ARP frames to a system, those ARP frames could claim that the attacker's layer two MAC address was the MAC address of the next hop router. Then the attacker can capture that traffic, forward it to the legitimate next hop router, uh, and maintain connectivity and maintain that information uh, while during that session and during that communication process. And the victim may not even notice anything suspicious in this case. Another variant of the man in the middle attack is when the attacker connects to a hub. Uh, or attaches a hub to the network 
Uh, and then that network segment carries the traffic that the attacker wants to capture. Uh, and then we can connect, uh, uh, you know, and, and gather that information. We could use span and other techniques as well, but that would mean that we would have to have uh, some sort of access to that device. All right. Now, another type of attack is a uh, more of a denial of service attack as well. It is what we call a TCP reset attack. This attack is also called a forged TCP reset or spoofed TCP reset packet attack, or just simply as they listed in the book here, a TCP reset attack. And the idea here is that we're just trying to terminate connections uh, by sending a TCP reset packet, right? Uh, it could cause a firewall or uh, other devices to interrupt communication if they, if they receive this uh, this type of attack. Uh, the internet itself is just a collection of computers that need to communicate with each other. And most of the protocols that we use to communicate on this internet are TCP based, where we have these two-way virtual connections that are required between the computers to communicate. All right, but there's a series of messages that we can incorporate within the TCP protocol that allows us to manage the flow of traffic between two hosts, set up the initial connection between two hosts, reset the connection if need be, and so on. Well, one of those flags that happens to be within the TCP header is called the reset flag or the RST flag. In most packets, this bit is gonna be a zero, meaning that it's not really gonna have any effect. That's the idea. Flag fields are on if they're set to one, they're off if they're set to zero. But if I set this reset flag to a one, it's gonna tell the receiving computer that I should immediately stop using this TCP connection. I'm not gonna send any more packets through this connection and we're gonna go ahead and discard any other packets that I received based on this connection. So basically, it kills that TCP connection immediately. All right, now in this particular scenario, if the TCP reset bit was sent by the computer that was one of the connection endpoints that could be considered legitimate. But it is possible for a, another computer to spoof those packets or forge those packets containing that TCP reset uh, to either one of the endpoints in the communication channel or actually to both of the end, endpoints. Uh, and then basically that would result in the, the session being closed uh, unexpectedly. All right. Now, ultimately, the goal here uh, from an attacker's perspective is just to disrupt those TCP connections without the consent of the parties involved. All right. Uh, there was a protocol, uh, uh, a, a, pro a program that was uh, called Buster, uh, which was uh, developed in the mid 90s that sent forged TCP resets. Uh, but uh, you know, there was another story uh, I remember reading about not too long ago, maybe a few years ago, Comcast uh, started using forged TCP resets to block groupware applications and peer-to-peer -peer applications. Uh, and uh, that they kind of went all against the whole concept of this, this network neutrality or net, ne net neutrality um, and, uh, and uh, the uh, the FCC got involved and uh, and and basically said, hey, Comcast, you're not allowed to do that. You need to stop doing that. All right. Now, what we're seeing in this particular diagram here is basically a graceful closing process, right? I sent you uh, some data. Uh, the host on the right is going to the server saying, hey, okay, I want to I'm going to use the finish flag and the acknowledgement flag to say, well, the act is for the data that was sent by the server. Uh, and then the host is saying, okay, I want to finish this connection. The server acknowledges that and sends its own finish. Uh, and then the, close, the, the session basically closes gracefully. But if for some reason I, I uh, get a reset flag set, I'm going to maybe do a, a, a retry, get the reset again, do a retry, get the reset again. Uh, and then all of a sudden that application will stop working or stop functioning by, uh, you know, uh, based on the fact that we're resetting that particular connection. All right. All right, let's see here. Which statement about 
TCP resets is correct. Uh, a TCP reset is, attack is designed to disrupt the three-way handshake. No, we would have already gone through the three-way handshake at this point. Uh, the TCP reset attack terminates the connection between the hosts. That sounds about right. So that is going to be our answer in this case. A uh, malicious attack is always indicated when the reset bit is set to one. No, that's not true. There are instances where the reset flag is necessary. Uh, you know, if I'm trying to connect to a server and that server is not listening on that particular port, typically the server will send a TCP reset. Uh, just to indicate to the uh, initiating client that, hey, I'm not listening on that port. Uh, in a TCP reset attack, the reset bit in the TCP packet must be set to one. Settings for the other fields in the header, header are irrelevant. Uh, well, yes, the reset bit is set to one, but settings in the other fields are not irrelevant. Uh, the other fields still have some meaning. Which TCP flag is used to initiate a graceful termination of a TCP connection. Graceful would be the fin flag. That's where we're going to go ahead and say, you know what, I'm done communicating. Let's please close this session gracefully. You'll acknowledge that. You'll send your own fin. I'll acknowledge that. And the session will be closed. So the next protocol uh, at the transport layer that we're going to talk about is UDP, uh, the user datagram protocol. Uh, the UDP protocol transfers data much differently than the transmission control protocol does. Uh, services that run on UDP make use of what we call a client and server model. It's the same basic client and server model that TCP uses, but it also can transfer data without an established connection. And we can also send data to multiple computers in a single packet. All right. So, as such, there are several different vulnerabilities that exist within UDP. We'll talk about them here. There aren't as many as, say, with TCP, but there are some weaknesses, particularly with UDP port scanning, active service enumeration, and passive network monitoring uh, that we can do with UDP. All right. Uh, is uh, why, um, you know, when we look at tools like uh, uh, Nessus, uh, and, and other scanning tools, there's often the question about why aren't there any UDP port scanner options in some of these scanning tools? Uh, and the, the short answer to that is that uh, we don't typically see any kind of generic UDP port scans that exist. We have enumeration of lots of different applications, but not specific general port scans. Uh, there's nothing wrong with performing a UDP scan, but uh, there, the, the tools that are available and the resources that are available typically uh, to probe for UDP ports often reports false information. All right. Now, in order for us to probe UDP ports, we have to send UDP packets on each of those ports and either wait for no response uh, or potentially some sort of UDP packet response or an ICMP port closed message. If I don't get a response from the, the scanner that I'm using, we could potentially conclude that the port is open. If I get some sort of ICMP port unreachable message, the scanner can conclude that that particular port is closed. But there are several po uh, potentials here for false positives and false negatives. For a lot of networks, when we're performing scans, especially on many different ports, on a lot of different systems at the same time, that actual probing packet might not actually make it to its target destination uh, because the network might be congested. Uh, and we, we would assume then, because we didn't receive that response, that we can conclude from the scanning tool's perspective that that particular port is open, all right? We might consider maybe trying the scan again, uh, you know, but again, this will take more time. All right. UDP is the unreliable data transport protocol. Actually, it's technically the user datagram protocol, but uh, the, the, the U is often referred to as unreliable or, or useless or whatever in, in uh, kind of as a joke, but it's the reality of the protocol itself. 
uh, UDP packets or UDP segments are, are kind of best effort delivery uh, segments. A device can drop those segments if the network is congested and, and they're generally considered to be somewhat, uh, uh, somewhat uh, uh, less important parts of our data flows. Firewall rules uh, between the scanners also might implicitly deny uh, ICMP messages that would allow us to, to identify whether a UDP port is responsive or, for, uh, responsive or not. So there's just many, many different things to consider when we're trying to identify whether or not a UDP port is open. We simply can't just send a UDP SYN request, SYN request because uh, by, na by its nature, UDP doesn't have a three-way handshake. Now the book talks about this uh, briefly and the, and the idea that we're talking about these different flow control mechanisms, uh, but we also have a lot of protocols that make use of UDP, uh, the network file system protocol, SNMP, uh, client-based DNS transactions, TFTP, uh, online games, uh, voice over IP, and so on. Um, UDP is technically vulnerable, even though the only thing that's contained within a UDP datagram is the source port destination port checksum. Uh, but the checksum itself is an optional field uh, which can be utilized to detect whether or not there are er any errors in the transmission. So it's easy for users uh, or computers to recompute uh, this checksum value for somebody that might want to uh, alter the data along its way. There's no secret information that goes into calculating this particular checksum. So it's like any kind of hashing process. If somebody intercepts the data, modifies the data, throws away the old checksum, and inserts a new checksum, there's no way for us to actually technically verify that that packet has been modified uh, in, in some way. Because, uh, uh, you know, again, there's no secret information that was used like keying material or crypto variable that was used in the hashing process. Uh, so there's no guarantee that the source address is involved in the conversation. We don't have any sequencing or acknowledgements and so on. Uh, most UDP related attacks are based on uh, denial of service or at least some sort of exhaustion of shared resources. Could be a bug in the protocol itself that could cause the system to crash, but generally speaking, most UDP types of attacks are gonna be based on some sort of denial of service. A UDP flood attack, as an example, very similar to a TCP flood attack, but in this case, we're not doing any kind of, uh, any kind of uh, TCP, SYN, SYNAC type of enumeration and type of attack, we're just sending as many UDP packets to random ports on the victims uh, on the on the victim computer as possible, in the hopes that we're overwhelming those particular ports with uh, just a large amount of information. SQL uh, slammer worm, the structured query language slammer worm, was a worm that was constructed in 2003 that caused a denial of service uh, and, uh, and and actually uh, affected the internet quite. Uh, uh, quickly, within a few minutes, uh, 75,000 or so computers were infected. Uh, and it took, uh, this exploit took advantage of the buffer overflow bug that existed in Microsoft SQL Server and all of their desktop engine database products. Now the worm itself uh, was actually based on uh, a proof of code concept that was done in the Black Hat briefings uh, who had discovered that buffer overflow vulnerabilities uh, existed that the worm could then exploit. Uh, it was basically just a small piece of code that did little else except for generate some random IP addresses and then, and then sent itself out to those particular addresses. And if those particular addresses happened to belong to a host that ran an unpatched copy of Microsoft SQL Server, specifically the replication service that was running on UDP port 1434, the host immediately became infected and then began uh, replicating itself with more copies of that worm program on the internet. Now, usually the, the home computers were not usually uh, vulnerable to this type of attack, uh, uh, but the worm was so small um, that it didn't even have to contain code 
that would actually write itself to disk. It basically just stayed in memory. Uh, now that made it easy to remove. So Symantec and other vendors eventually created a removal tool to remove the worm. Uh, but it was a, uh, an example of taking, uh, or, or an, a good example of taking advantage of a vulnerability that existed or, uh, uh, that was actually uh, manifested over UDP. All right. And they mentioned in the book the, the buffer overflow vulnerabilities were exploited by sending uh, a specifically malformed packet to the, the SQL Server Resolution Service, uh, which caused a heap or the stack memory to be overwritten. Uh, and then it would then replicate itself to other hosts on the, in the network. So even though we don't talk about specific types or forms of attack within UDP, UDP is still a protocol. It still contains uh, communication standards uh, that allow us to open up ports and open up communications. Uh, so it is vulnerable to attack. Okay. Which application layer protocol that uses UDP to manage and monitor devices on the network could be exploited if it's not secured on the devices. In this particular case, the answer to this question is the Simple Network Management Protocol, or SNMP. TFTP is a UDP-based application. It works on port 69, but it is not used to monitor or manage network devices. HTTPS, FTP, SMTP, these are all TCP-based protocols so they wouldn't uh, uh, be the correct answer in this particular case. SNMP, Simple Network Management Protocol, is UDP-based. So the next thing we'll talk about is general types of attack surfaces and different types of attack vectors. By definition, uh, an attack service uh, is the sum of the different points, what we would refer to as attack vectors, where the attacker can try to enter data or extract data from a particular environment, right? Uh, and, and our goal in any kind of threat mitigation is to keep that attack surface as small as possible using different types of uh, mitigation techniques. Now, there are many, many different types of attack vectors that exist, uh, hundreds and hundreds of different attack vectors. Uh, but some of the common ones would be things like compromised credentials, weak or stolen passwords, a malicious insider in your organization, misuse of encryption or, or poor encryption, misconfiguration of a device, ransomware, uh, taking advantage of trust relationships and maybe a pivoting attack, uh, phishing attacks, zero day vulnerabilities, uh, brute force attacks. I mean, there's just a bunch of different types of attack vectors. But due to the increase of potential vulnerable points that exist within an enterprise, there is an increasing advantage for hackers and attackers as they simply need to find one of those vulnerable points in order to succeed in their particular attack. So there are basically three steps to understanding and visualizing a particular attack surface. Visualizing the system is the first step, right? That's your reconnaissance, that's your exploration of the system by mapping out all of the devices, by mapping out the paths and the networks, we can visualize the system itself. Then we find indicators of exposure. This is the second step. Each indicator of a vulnerability could then potentially expose that system within the map uh, and we could because they might you know be missing specific security controls or they might not have the right components in place and then finally find the indicators of compromise uh, would be this would be an instance where maybe an attack has already succeeded okay so the overall approach and this is what we're talking about in this particular section here of improving the overall security of the system is to reduce the attack surface of the system or the software or the components in the network. Uh, basic strategies of attack service reduction include reducing the amount of variables in code that might be running in a particular environment, the types of devices, the different vendors, reduce the specific entry points that are available to specific untrusted users, 
eliminate unnecessary services, uh, uh, secure access to those that need access by relatively uh, reducing the amount of users with authorized credentials. Uh, all of these things will, will allow for the reduction of the attack surface by uh, introducing fewer security risks in the environment. Now, reducing the attack service reduction can prevent security breaches, but it doesn't mitigate the amount of, uh, of damage than a, that an attacker could actually do or accomplish once they gain access to the system. Everything about the attack surface is all about, or reducing the act, attack service is reducing the likelihood. We're not reducing the potential damage. Now we see here on this graph here, we have kind of four major categories of attack surface that we're looking at. Network, software, physical, and social engineering. The network attack surface is the, uh, is the totality, if you will, of the vulnerabilities for the connected hardware and software that might ultimately be accessible by unauthenticated users. Every point of network interaction is a part of the network attack service. All right, a network's attack service could be exploited through things like remote access, uh, uh, blatant intrusion through both wireless networks or wired networks, um, but it is a uh, it is in essence what we would consider the complete view of the attack surface. You know, VPNs, peer-to-peer -peer networking, Teredo tunneling. These are all things that would be considered threats to the network, uh, which would provide us the ability to uh, circumvent things like IPSs and other types of security measures that we might have in place. Uh, we could have unnecessary ports that are running on the network. Uh, we need to make sure we close those unnecessary ports and stop using insecure protocols, like instead of using Telnet, use SSH. Instead of using SNMPv2 or SNMPv1, use SNMPv3 and so on. We need to limit the resources that are available to these untrusted users, uh, perform things like 802.1x authentication, MACSEC or MAC security, uh, 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 you know, anything that would increase the overall security of the physical network itself. You know, let's not use protocols like Telnet or FTP, uh, SMTP, uh, or, you know, file sharing services like NFS or SMB. Uh, make sure that we use the secure version of those protocols. Make sure that we've also identified weak points in the network. It's oftentimes uh, done where we, where we would go in and we would secure access to our servers, secure access to the clients, but then the IoT devices that exist on the network, printers, uh, cameras, webcams, uh, thermostats, uh, anything that's connected to the network, smart televisions and so on, we don't look at those uh, and, then, uh, and then all of a sudden those become attack vectors uh, that reduce the overall security or, or increase the overall network attack surface. A software attack surface is really defined as a profile of all the functions of code running in the system that would uh, be available to some sort of unauthenticated user. All right, the more surface there is, the better the chance an attacker or malware or some sort of exploit can gain access to the code that's running on a particular machine. So the software attack surface is particularly at risk with things like internet facing applications like web-based applications or file transfer applications and so on, which expose the coding to the internet itself. Flawed functions within the applications could lead to compromise of the entire network uh, of an unverified user or a hacker or a corporate spy or whoever it might be with a goal to steal data or gain access or even elevate their privileges to an administrative level or something to that effect, all right? So uh, uh, when you're considering 
software attack surfaces, we also need to consider insider threats. Users that actually authenticate with valid credentials may be able to access unprotected data beyond their authorization level if access controls are improperly implemented or they're not implemented uh, uh, you know, correctly, all right? Because uh, any running code could have exploitable vulnerabilities. One of the simplest ways to limit the software attack surface is to simply reduce the amount of code that's being run at any particular time. So if a program is not being used or other installed software can actually you know, perform the same task or similar task, then we should eliminate that application. Make sure we have antiviruses installed. Hardware and software firewalls can also block access to systems as well. Operating systems and application updates can patch weaknesses in the software itself. Uh, so it's important to understand the overall security to minimize the number of vulnerabilities to begin with. So we're considering different attack vectors in software design as well. Many different attacks uh, uh, approach, uh, uh, different attack approaches, I should say, really take a, uh, advantage of a combination of different attack surfaces to get the desired access or to get the uh, you know, the desired outcome of that particular exploit. So it's very important that we also implement defense in depth. So when we're talking about the software attack service, we're talking about the different um, kinds of code, applications, email services, configurations of devices, compliance policies, databases, uh, executable dynamic link libraries, or, or executable files, I should say, and dynamic link libraries, mobile applications, all of these things need to be considered. Unpatched software is a huge concern as well. Uh, you know, the uh, unpatched uh, operating systems, unpatched third-party applications can, can increase the uh, software attack surface because a lot of these applications are installed and used ubiquitously across the enterprise, uh, like an Acrobat reader type of application or, or some other email application or whatnot, all right? Uh, a lot of publicly known security vulnerabilities do get listed in the CVE. That's that Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures database, uh, which allows us to identify and share information about different types of attacks. A physical attack service, uh, surface, excuse me, uh, anything that uh, generally would be considered exploitable through some sort of insider threat, like a rogue employee, uh, social engineering tricks, intruders who pose as, as service workers, you know, I'm coming in to fix your heating and air conditioning system or whatever. Uh, these could be uh, considered physical uh, attack vectors uh, where I might be able to gain access to a physical facility and then use other means, uh, other uh, attack surfaces then to gain access to other resources. And then of course we also have our social engineering aspect, right? Social engineering attacks uh, are, are, you know, where we simply take advantage of human nature, right? Human psychology, if you will. Uh, we get somebody to do something that they normally wouldn't do because they think you're a trusted uh, individual they're trying to be helpful, whatever it might be, right? Uh, maybe get them to browse to a website that, that they normally wouldn't browse to by, by spoofing uh, the source, uh, doing a farming attack or a phishing attack and so on. Uh, social engineering attacks and uh, consequently the social engineering attack service has to be managed uh, both technically and administratively. We have to have usage policies in place, we have to have training, we have to uh, have user awareness, uh, we also have to have tools that uh, prevent things like phishing and farming attacks from taking place or, or uh, you know, personally identifiable, uh, identifi identifiable information from being exfiltrated from the organization by having some sort of data loss prevention technique in, in place and so on. All right. Uh, the the idea, though, is that we have to consider the attack surface from all of these vectors, from all of these vectors. Uh, and our goal ultimately is to reduce the overall attack surface. 
Uh, we can't mitigate it 100%. We can't reduce it to zero, but we would at least like to reduce it to a manageable point. Again, trying to change two factors. What is the likelihood that an attack will occur or that a threat will be realized? And then what is the potential damage after that, right? And the book does go through some common uh, threats like reconnaissance types of attacks. Uh, is there a firewall? What kind of devices run in the network and so on? Uh, known vulnerabilities, uh, SQL injections, phishing attacks, malware, a weak authentication. There's lots and lots of examples, obviously, of different types of attacks. All right. All right. Which two options might be considered attack surfaces in a network environment? Open ports, privacy settings, the use of SSH, the use of Telnet. Well, certainly the use of Telnet would probably qualify here, right? The use of Telnet in this case would be using a weak application. So we would go ahead and mark that one off. I would rather use SSH instead of Telnet. Uh, SSH is encrypted. Uh, privacy settings, uh, well, we could, I suppose, say this could be true if there were weak privacy settings, uh, but they don't really distinguish that. And certainly open ports, uh, I would even venture to say unnecessary open ports in this case probably would be considered part of the attack surface. Which type of common security threat can be solved by patching the operating system or hardware device? Phishing attacks are social engineering attacks, um, so uh, they wouldn't. Uh, we wouldn't. A patching an operating system wouldn't help with that. SQL injection is a specific application. Uh, we need uh, to to understand, of course, how information gets entered into the database. Uh, we need to do information verification, formatting verification, and so on. Malware is too generic. Known vulnerabilities. Typically, a known vulnerability is what we're patching against. Most vendors, if they're developing their operating system and they identify a known vulnerability, they will use uh, information, uh, uh, you know, that information to develop patches and, 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 of course, block those vulnerabilities. Weak authentication is just poor implementation. All right. Now, the next thing we'll talk about are different types of reconnaissance attacks. Oftentimes, this is the first step in any type of attacker's uh, profile. Uh, they need to identify the active systems. They need to identify uh, what the vulnerabilities or potential vulnerabilities in those particular systems might be. So it's important in this particular case to be able to identify uh, those vulnerabilities by scanning and, and whatnot. So there's many different ways that we can perform reconnaissance. The idea, of course, is to discover information about the network about the computing systems, what are the IP addresses of the clients on the network, what are the domains, what are uh, the targets or relatable targets on the network, uh, and so on, right? What are potentially the operating systems that they're running? What are the open ports and whatnot on those particular systems? And they identify four major categories for gathering network information. Uh, now, ping sweeps, uh, I'll skip to this one first because we kind of already talked about this when we talked about ICMP, right? The idea of a ping sweep is to use some sort of tool like Nmap or, or uh, you know, other ping, you know, angry IP scanner or something like that to be able to just simply identify hosts that respond to an ICMP echo request. Basically, we're just trying to identify which hosts are, are active and which hosts are not active. And that's a very, very basic network discovery tool. Once we've identified the hosts that are active, we can utilize other tools to gain additional information about those hosts and then potential vulnerabilities and so on. Packet sniffers uh, is a good way like Wireshark or other packet captures, uh, Ethercap or Network Miner, to give us the ability to capture traffic on the network. Now, granted, in most modern networks, this becomes a bit more of a challenge because most modern networks, packets are going to generally be uh, switched to, to specific destinations as opposed to flooded. Uh, but there are even ways to uh, cause traffic to be flooded. If I can, for example, launch a cam overflow attack against a switch, 
and it's the core switch in the network and I can fill up the CAM table with a bunch of bogus MAC address entries, then the switch will start flooding all of the legitimate traffic, which then I can use these network capture packets or these network capturing uh, packet capturing tools to capture that information, right? Port scans, again, we talked about that as well. Being able to enumerate hosts to identify what open ports might exist, whether they are FTP ports or uh, Telnet or SSH or whatever it might be, or TCP related ports or UDP related ports. Uh, and then we can do information queries, internet based information queries. We can do who is lookups, we can do uh, reverse IP domain lookups, we can look at internet registries and look at uh, DNS registries, uh, domain registries and so on to gather information about individuals on, on the internet. We can also even extend that to doing things like social, uh, social networking searches or public records information searches and so on. So it really depends on what information you're trying to gather but you do have the ability to, to, to do uh, quite a bit of reconnaissance these days, uh, kind of what we call e-dumpster diving, if you will, or, or e-research, e where we're able to capture information that might exist on the, on the network. Now, as far as reconnaissance goes, we have passive reconnaissance versus active reconnaissance. We can see some of the kind of passive reconnaissance categories, right? Website information, uh, Shodan user groups. Shodan, as an example, is basically just a search engine that allows us to search for specific information about internet connected devices. Uh, web search engines like Google, uh, Bing, uh, they're good for finding website information. But what if you want to measure, for example, uh, which countries are becoming more connected? or you want to know what version of Microsoft IIS is the most popular in the world, or you want to find a control server for malware or something like that. Shodan is actually something that gathers information about all the devices that are connected to the internet. Uh, if a device is directly hooked up to the internet, then Shodan will query it for publicly available information, uh, the types of devices and whatnot, and all that information gets indexed uh, and then we can, we can uh, see that information. So we can go uh, look at the Shodan in, uh, index. Uh, we can identify network security components. Uh, we can use Shodan information for market research uh, and so on. It's, it's really different uh, in, in that Shodan really looks at devices that are connected to the internet Whereas a search engine like Google uh, will look at stuff that's on the World Wide Web, right? Makes up, uh, you know, all, all of the, uh, the public websites and searchable content that's on the Internet. Shodan is more concerned about, you know, the, the complete picture, if you will, of the Internet itself. So passive reconnaissance means that we're just basically gathering information uh, you know, from clients that are just simply connected. Whereas active reconnaissance means I'm actually doing something to the network, right? I'm scanning the network for open ports. I'm doing ping sweeps to identify reachable hosts. I'm doing trace routes uh, to identify routing in layer three paths. I'm doing OS fingerprinting. Don't confuse this with a passive or active attack. Uh, a passive or active attack uh, would be, a passive attack would be you know, uh, a scenario in which we're trying to disrupt communication, but we're not trying to be part of that communication for the purposes of, of uh, uh, you know, um, getting into a network or getting into a network resource. Uh, whereas an active attack would be, uh, my goal of an active attack would be to actually gain access to a system and steal information. All right. Now, one of these tools uh, that we have available to us is something called Who Is, uh, and uh, Who Is 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 really just a uh, internet record listing that identifies who owns a domain and how to get in touch with those individuals. Now, most of this information is privatized. Now, uh, here you can see uh, WhoIsExample.com. You can see the street address, the hometown, the, the zip code, the phone number. Uh, DNS servers, we would also see uh, a person's information and so on. Most of these records are privately 
uh, uh, held now, and, and most of this information is hidden. Uh, but the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, or ICANN, is the organization that regulates domain name registration and domain name ownership. And who has records uh, have been in the past, not so much now, but in the past very useful for maintaining. Uh, well, I, I guess in this sense it, it is still useful, but uh, be, being that they're privatized, not so much for the attackers, but typically these were useful for uh, ensuring the integrity of the domain name registration process and the website ownership process. A who, a who is record just contains all of the contact information that's associated to the person, the group, or the company that registers a domain. All right. Uh, each who is record contains information like contact information of the registrant. Uh, that would be the individual who owns the domain the name and contact information of the registrar. Uh, that would be the organization that, that, that registered the domain name on behalf of the client, the registration dates, the name servers, uh, expiration dates, and so on. All right, there are actually two different data models for storing who is information. We don't really need to get into the specifics. There's a thin model and a thick model, um, but we don't, we don't need to get into the specifics of that now. Um, the privacy is obviously pretty critical here. It's important to, that there's no way to hide the existence of a domain registration uh, and anybody can check the Whois registry to see the status of a domain. And by the way, the ICANN actually requires that contact information of those who actually own and manage the domain uh, should be made publicly available. Um, but uh, a lot of registrars now offer what we call private registration services or a proxy service where the registrar's contact information is shown and not the registrant. And that's pretty typical these days. Um, the, 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 um, the goal here obviously is to hide the end user in this particular case. Uh, with regard to the Shodan search engine, I kind of mentioned that already. Uh, it's, uh, they, they say here it's a, a search engine with metadata filter capabilities that can help an attacker identify a specific device, uh, such as a computer, a router, or a server. Uh, we can search for a specific system, like an ASA, running a certain version of software, and then look for vulnerabilities within that particular platform. We can see here as an example, they did a search on Cisco ASA and they pulled up different devices. Uh, now in this case here, we see Microtech uh, doesn't indicate that this is necessarily an ASA, but we can see the host name includes the term Cisco ASA. Uh, here's another device that actually has uh, a um, key type. Uh, it looks like it's running SSH for specifically for Cisco. Uh, so we were able to maybe identify that that particular device was an ASA and so on. Um, but uh, again, we can use this information. You can actually click on these IP addresses and get more detailed information about those particular protocols, or excuse me, those particular dev devices, and then potentially look at what types of, uh, of uh, exploits might be available for those particular devices. Shodan.io is the website uh, and then you can do various searches and scans and so on. Now there is another thing they mentioned here uh, called robots.txt. Uh, this is what we would refer to as the robot exclusion standard or the robots exclusion uh, protocol or uh, as we see listed here in the book simply robots.txt. Uh, and this is a standard that's used by different websites to communicate with different web crawlers like Google and other, uh, uh, you know, search engines and whatnot, or web robots, uh, and it allows us a way of identifying how to inform the web robot about which areas of the website website should not be processed or scanned. Uh, robots are often used by different search engines to categorize websites. Uh, not all robots necessarily cooperate with the standard, right? Spam bots and malware and email harvesters and so on don't typically 
uh, represent themselves honestly and they don't use the standard or comply with the standard. Uh, but the idea is that we're trying to create a standard for, uh, for, for providing instructions to web robot, robots to, to uh, view the website and so on. And the text file that's actually created is uh, called robots.txt. It's actually stored in the root of the website uh, hierarchy. Uh, so uh, cisco.com slash robots.txt. Uh, and it basically just includes instructions in a specific format. We can see an example here uh, where we have the cisco.com slash robots.txt. And we're saying, okay, we're going to disallow uh, web slash telepresence dot slash pro, uh, disallow CGI dash bin, uh, PC, uh, PCGI dash bin, and so on. Uh, but robots will choose to follow the instructions uh, as they try to fetch particular files uh, or when they look at this robots.txt file, they'll follow those instructions and then they'll use those instructions or those directives, if you will, when they're trying to gain access to other information on the site. Uh, now, it, it is possible for the file to not exist. Uh, web robots basically assume that uh, the website owner doesn't want to place any limitations if the file doesn't exist and they will act as such. All right. Uh, it's basically a file on the website that will function as a request that specific robots ignore specific files or directories when they're crawling through the site. Uh, generally, this is going to be out of a preference for privacy. Uh, you know, to hide information from search engine results. Uh, maybe the content of the selected directories could be misleading, or maybe they're kind of irrelevant to the, the categorization of the site as a whole. Uh, but anyway, that's what the, the file is uh, generally used for. So from the screenshot here, we can see these options like disallow with the colon and the forward slash. That basically tells the browser uh, not to visit uh, uh, this particular source, but a disallow could be ignored by um, the, uh, uh, you know, um, based on the fact that we, want to, we don't want to disclose that information to the public. All right, we can use uh, active reconnaissance tools. Uh, like I said, uh, ping sweeps, trace routes, port scans, operating system fingerprinting utilities, to send packets to discover the systems. Uh, and these are, these are different types of enumeration tools that are available to us. Network Mapper is another example. Uh, Network Mapper allows me to scan uh, systems. And there are a whole bunch of different NMAP functions that you can implement. There's some relatively uh, robust scanning techniques that you can implement, uh, as well as some basic scanning techniques. It's a little bit beyond the scope of this course to talk about specifically all the functions of NMAP or ZenMap if you want to use the graphical version or any kind of general network mapping tool. But the idea is that we're able to enumerate the network. You notice here we're sending a bunch of TCP send requests uh, in the hopes that we're able to identify what ports are open on a, on a particular computer. All right. Uh, and we can see that uh, we, we did a send request to port 139, 135, 445, port 80, port 22, port 515, 23, and so on. And the idea is that we're trying to identify uh, through the receipt of a SYNAC uh, or uh, conversely, in the opposite, uh, a receipt of a reset, whether or not that port is open or closed. Vulnerability scanners, uh, much more robust. Uh, topic really the vulnerability scanners is is um, uh, can include lots and lots of different tools and lots of different options so we won't spend too much time talking about that but a vulnerability scanner uh, typically deployed or or uh, identified by the vendor uh, will give us the opportunity to identify weaknesses in a system uh, based on you know uh, identifying specific vulnerabilities within that system okay which three options or methods that are used by an attacker while gathering network data? Unplugged network devices. That probably wouldn't get us a whole lot of information. Yes, we can use a packet sniffer. Absolutely, a packet sniffer 
is very useful in identifying uh, types of traffic, types of protocols, and so on. Uh, port sniffers, not really such a thing. A ping sniffer, not such a thing. Certainly a ping sweep and port scans would be what we would do to be able to identify what's happening in the network. All right. Uh, let's see, which utility allows you to cycle through all well-known ports to provide a complete list of all the services that are running on a ho host? That would be our network mapping application. Nmap uh, allows us to do that. Now, Wireshark is a, whoa, I don't know how that got like that. Let me fix that real quick. Wireshark is a packet capture tool. Who is is a reconnaissance tool. Can enables typically a password uh, recovery tool or password cracking tool. And UDP Unicorn is a denial of service attack package. Uh, so that wouldn't apply in this particular case. All right. Another type of attack is an access attack. Uh, and an access attack is, is exactly what it sounds like, what the name implies. It's a way for us to gain access to a device, to an application, to data, to a network service, to a resource by unauthorized means. So we uh, will either brute force or dictionary attack a password or take advantage of weak password policies or weak passwords within the system to gain access to a, uh, to a system. We can use tools like John the Ripper or Kane Enable, password cracking tools. We can use uh, pass the hash type of attacks, um, take advantage of weak cryptographic processes or weak crypt cryptographic systems, vulnerabilities within cryptographic processes. We can do masquerading and spoofing attacks where I try to impersonate an individual uh, we can do session hijacking, we can implement malware and whatnot. But the whole point of an access attack is to allow us to compromise a system to gain access to that particular system. And it could be an individual a system, it could be a, a group of resources, it could be a network, uh, a host, an application, or whatever it might be. All right. Which option is an attack in which the session established by the client to the server is taken over by a malicious process. Uh, well, that would be, in this particular case, session hijacking. That's what we talked about previously. We talked about the whole concept of session hijacking when it comes to different attack vectors. Uh, session hijacking is where I actually take over a session on a uh, computer or in a communication process. Now, a man-in-the-middle attack is when the attacker intercepts communication between two authorized party uh, to either uh, also authorized parties to either secretly eavesdrop on a conversation or to modify or intercept traffic that's traveling between the two communicators. Attackers could use man-in-the-middle attacks to steal login credentials, to steal personal uh, personal information to spy on the victims or to sabotage the communication that's occurring between the two, right? Uh, the man in the middle attack is usually a means to an end. The aim, like I said, could be spying on individuals or group, uh, redirecting funds, resources, uh, applications, data, whatever it might be. Uh, we can protect against man in the middle attacks with encryption, but attackers still could reroute traffic to phishing sites uh, that are maybe designed to look legitimate or simply pass traffic to the intended destination once we've harvested records or data or mined the data in, in general. A man in the middle attacks are one of the oldest forms of cyber attacks that exist. Uh, we've been looking at lots and lots of different types of man in the middle attacks since the 80s actually. Uh, and it's really just a process, a, a way of describing the act of sitting between the connection of two authorized party parties for manipulating that traffic flow. And uh, by the way, that could also include interfering with legitimate networks, creating fake networks, compromising traffic, and so on. Uh, there are a whole bunch of different techniques, uh, and each of these techniques have different potential outcomes depending on 
what the target of the attack is or what the general goal of the attack is. For example, SSL stripping uh, is, a, is a type of attack where the attackers establish an HTTPS connection between themselves and the server, but with an unsecured HTTP connection with the end user, which means that information is sent in plain text from the end user without encryption. Evil twin attacks mirror legitimate wireless access points, uh, but they are controlled entirely by the attacker who can now monitor, collect, or manipulate information from the users and the information that the user sends. Uh, in a banking scenario, for example, an attacker could, could see that a user is making some sort of transfer or uh, you know, manage the, they may be managing their funds or whatever. We can change the destination account number uh, or the amount or the dollar amount that's being sent. All right. Uh, threat actors could use these man in the middle attacks to harvest personal information uh, to get login credentials. Uh, we could detect applications that are being downloaded or updated. Uh, and for that purpose, we could then compromise those updates to install malware that can be sent to. Uh, the, the, the end result. Uh, the evil grade exploit kit uh, was actually one of these that was specifically designed to target poorly secured updates. Uh, so the attacks can be automated. They can come in many different forms uh, and so on. All right. In fact, we see here examples of OSI layer man in the middle attacks include at the physical layer, tapping into somebody's physical connection. Uh, uh, now, a emanation type of attack would not necessarily be considered a man-in-the-middle attack because we're not actually intercepting the information. Uh, we're just capturing the information passively. But I could tap into uh, install a physical network tap and tap into the communication between two clients at the physical layer. At the data link layer, I could use something like art poisoning, right? Art poisoning is a way of, uh, of us poisoning the art cache of a client so that when they generate their frames, they address their frames to the attacker, and then the attacker captures that information and forwards it on to its final destination. Uh, we have session layer attacks. Uh, SSL and TLS man-in-the-middle attacks, like I just described, uh, 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 try to decrypt uh, examine information, re-encrypt it over an SSL or TLS tunnel. Uh, but we also must have the appropriate certificates to do that. In order to decrypt SSL or TLS information, we would have already had to capture the private certificate of the recipient so that we can actually utilize that certificate to decrypt the information. Application layer attacks, uh, uh, you know, again, trying to install malware, trying to uh, attack the victim's web browser, uh, to install malicious code, scrutinizing URL, uh, URL information to redirect them to specific URLs. These are the types of attacks that might uh, uh, be deemed uh, application layer type of attack. All right. So we see here, uh, they actually make mention of a specific type of attack, what we refer to as an ARP poisoning attack. So in an ARP poisoning attack, which is also referred to sometimes as an ARP spoofing attack, is a type of attack that's done over our layer two network. Uh, and the whole goal is that we send malicious ARP packets to a gateway or to the network to change the pairings of the IP to MAC address bindings in the MAC address table or the ARP, not the MAC address table, excuse me, the ARP cache. So the ARP protocol, the address resolution protocol, is designed to translate IP addresses into MAC addresses, or at least to associate uh, a known IP address to an unknown MAC address. Now, ARP was not designed with security in mind. It was designed for efficiency. So ARP poisoning attacks are actually very easy to carry out, carry out as long as the attacker has some control of a machine within the local area network that it's attached to, all right? The attack itself consists of the attacker sending false ARP reply messages to the default gateway or to clients within the network. We see that listed here in this case, uh, informing that their MAC address should be associated 
with the attacker's MAC address, not the actual intended uh, uh, destination's MAC address. And, and we would do that typically in both directions. Once we've received that message, which is broadcasted out, it changes uh, that information in its local ARP cache, and then the traffic is sent to the attacker uh, as a man in the middle um, endpoint. So we have host A on the left with MAC address A, and it is trying to resolve the MAC address of B, which is a, a legitimate MAC address for 10114. The attacker is essentially poisoning both host A's and host B's MAC address table saying, uh, if you want to talk to 10114, you need to come to MAC address D, which is the attacker's MAC address. And it says to host B, if you want to talk to 10113, you need to go to host D's MAC address, which is, uh, which is this, uh, this MAC address. And we're poisoning the local ARP cache of those clients. So now that all the traffic that's going between host A and host B goes through the attacker's computer. All right. Now there are some other uh, types of man-in-the-middle attacks. An ICMP-based man-in-the-middle attack is uh, done by spoofing ICMP redirect messages. We talked a little bit about this in our ICMP vulnerabilities section. Uh, and routers generally have static routes or they have some sort of route protection mechanisms uh, like R uh, RPF or strict RPF or loose RPF installed to identify that the path is a legitimate path. Uh, DNS-based man-in-the-middle attacks uh, where we're poisoning DNS or spoofing a DNS server, uh, modifying the local host file or whatever it might be. So if somebody browses to citibank.com, they get an address of 1234, uh, but then the, uh, uh, the imposter is saying, okay, well, if you want to go to citibank.com, go to 5678, right? Uh, and then we steal information, harvest credentials, and whatnot. DHCP-based man-in-the-middle attacks can be facilitated relatively easy, easily by spoofing a DHCP server within the enterprise and just ensuring, uh, ensuring that our DHCP responses or, or offer messages get to the client before any other DHCP offers. And in that, we send them fake gateway information or fake DNS information uh, and so on, and, and it, as such, poison the IP address information that a client has, is, uh, has so that that client starts sending that, their traffic to the attacker uh, uh, unwillingly, all right? Uh, we, we depend on these protocols quite a bit within our enterprise. DHCP, ARP, DNS, all of these protocols are dynamic by nature. Uh, and as such, their intent was to, be, uh, to, was to promote usability and ease of use within the network. So oftentimes you'll find that these protocols lack a whole lot of security mechanisms that would ensure that the protocols would operate and function securely rather than efficiently and easily. So oftentimes these protocols are quite vulnerable to different types of attacks. Uh, which option best describes a man in the middle attack? Easily detected and not a threat, definitely would not be the case. Uh, all types of attacks are generally considered a threat, whether they're easy to detect or not. A system has the ability to view the communication between two systems and impose itself in the communication path between those systems. That sounds about right to me. Uh, it seems like a pretty apt description for a man in the middle attack. A device that connects to a switch and issues an enormous amount of DHCP requests until the DHCP server runs out of IP addresses is a denial of service attack, specifically a resource exhaustion attack. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with actually inserting yourself into the conversation. A device that issues an extreme number of SIN requests to a server, uh, also a denial of service attack. We're not putting ourselves into the path of the conversation, so therefore it would not be considered a man in the middle attack. Now, a lot of these attacks that we've talked about, we've talked about in the context of uh, attacking confidentiality or attacking, uh, attacking integrity, uh, but there's also a concern for availability. And generally speaking, denial of service attacks or distributed denial of service attacks are attacks against, a uh, against availability.
And even though we've already kind of described this concept earlier when we talked about some of the, the security threats that exist within an enterprise, a denial of service attack prevents users from accessing a service by overwhelming either its physical resources or logical network connections. Basically, the attack floods the service with so much traffic or data that no one else can actually access that information, all right, or access that resource. One way to overload a service's physical resource is to send so many requests within a short period of time that it overwhelms all of the available memory, processing, storage space, etc., cetera, uh, and actually could even lead to some physical damage of the system itself. Uh, to, disrupt, to disrupt things like a service's uh, network connections, we can send malformed data, overwhelm the number of connections, and so on. Uh, occasionally, denial of service attacks can exploit a vulnerability in a program, but for the most part, we are actually simply trying to take advantage of what a system is already designed to do. Uh, the amount of data that is used in a, uh, this type of attack can be pretty massive, uh, tens of thousands of gigabits a second. Botnets are often used to do these types of attacks, although they were typically used as a distributed denial of service attack, which we talked about a little bit earlier, right? Uh, now, the idea of a distributed denial of service attack, which is what we see in this diagram here, is to create this botnet. A bunch of infected computers, all the ones with the exclamation points on them, are part of our, those are our zombie computers that are part of our botnet. All of these computers are infected with some sort of malware that allows a command and control server to take control of those machines and launch their attack, whatever that attack might be. Could be a TCP send flood attack, uh, could be a, 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 you know, a, a ping of death, whatever it might be, uh, it's going to deny service to whatever, whoever or whomever the victim is. Now the book does go on to describe the concept of a botnet. We did talk about the concept of a botnet in one of our earlier discussions, but I wanna go ahead and go through this again uh, just to make sure that we're clear. We'll talk a little bit about how a botnet works, what are the different stages uh, within a botnet, and so on. Uh, botnets are basically just networks of hijacked computer devices that carry out commands, cyber attacks, scams, whatever it might be, based on commands that it receives from a command and control server. The term botnet is actually formed from the words robot and network, uh, because a botnet is basically just multiple computers uh, that, uh, that serve as a tool to automate mass attacks, like data theft, server crashing, malware distribution, whatever it might be. Botnets will use the devices to scam other people or cause disruptions to network services, but without your particular consent, all right? Botnets are built to grow. They're built for automation, they're built for speed, uh, and they're built to in, uh, increase the hacker's ability to carry out large scale distributed types of attacks. Uh, one person or a small team of hackers could easily carry out, carry out tens of thousands of transactions from one local machine by simply having this, uh, 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 you know, hundreds or thousands or even tens of thousands of computers that are part of that particular botnet. So a bot herder uh, is a term that we use in this concept. It basically uh, is a device that collectively uh, hijacks devices uh, with remote commands. Uh, and once we've compiled all the bots in our network, the herder is gonna use command programming to drive whatever actions they're trying to drive. Uh, so basically, whoever's taking those command duties would have uh, set up the botnet uh, uh, and, uh, and, and made that botnet operational. The zombie computers or the bots themselves are the malware-infected devices that have been taken over 
for the use within the botnet itself. Uh, these devices operate essentially mindlessly under the commands that are generated by the bot herder. Okay, now the basic steps of building a botnet, there's only a few of them. Number one, prepare and expose. We exploit vulnerabilities to expose users to malware. Number two, we infect the devices. Those devices get infected with the malware that can then take control of their device. And then the third step would be to activate. We mobilize those infected devices to then uh, carry out our attacks. All right. So stage one of the overall exposure starts with hackers simply trying to find a vulnerability in a website, in an application, in human behavior. And the goal, of course, is to set up users for being unknowingly exposed to this malware infection. Uh, and, uh, and then in turn, they'll become part of that botnet. In stage two, the user gets infected with the botnet malware, uh, taking that action that compromises their particular device. Uh, maybe we were using a Trojan virus. Uh, maybe we had a drive-by download. Uh, maybe somebody visited an infected site. Uh, but it doesn't really matter what the overall delivery method is. The whole goal here is to breach the security of not only this computer, but thousands of other computers. Once the hackers are ready, then they initialize stage three by taking control of each of the computers. Uh, the, the infected machines in the network, which are you know, uh, referred to as the bots in this particular case, um, is, uh, is what we use, right? We can infect and control thousands or tens of thousands or even millions of computers. There have been some botnets that uh, infected upwards of 20 to 30 million computers. All right. Uh, and this becomes part of our zombie network. All right. Uh, now, the whole point of a botnet is to gather information, uh, reading or writing systems, uh, system information or data, getting personal information, sending files, monitoring activities, uh, all, all kinds of things, right? Uh, what types of devices can be controllable? Well, just anything that connects to the network, right? Traditional computers, mobile devices, infrastructure hardware, IoT devices, and so on. Issuing commands is a big part of this overall process of controlling the botnet. But anonymity is really critical here as well. Uh, and botnets are operated typically through remote control. There's a server called the command and control server, uh, which is the source of all of the botnet instructions. Uh, and this is the bot herder's main computer each zombie computer gets commands from that server. So each botnet can be led by commands either directly or indirectly. We can do centralized client server, or we can do a, de a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer model. Uh, in a centralized model, we have one bot herder server, um, and it's basically uh, us trickling down or sending information to the, to the bots in the network. In a decentralized model, the, instru uh, the uh, instructions, uh, you know, and the responsibility of executing instructions fall across many different computers. As long as I can contact any one of the zombie computers, they can be then used to spread commands and uh, instruct in a peer-to-peer -peer type of model uh, commands to the other computers in the in the in the botnet, right? Uh, we use these things, or botnets are typically used uh, for financial theft, information theft, sabotage, cryptocurrency scams, selling access to criminals, and so on. All right. Uh, other types of botnet attacks would be uh, spamming attacks, distributed denial of service attacks, phishing attacks, brute force attacks, all kinds of different attacks. All right. All right. Let's see here. We talked about all of this. Uh, let's see. What do attackers use to launch an attack on a location without the attack coming directly from the attacker's location? Well, we actually just talked about that, right? The idea is that we're using this command and control server to act as 
the server to proxy all the commands to the botnet uh, and uh, in turn then that allows us to uh, perform that attack right without having to do it directly from the attackers computer let's talk about reflection and amplification attacks as well we've already kind of talked about these types of attacks uh, briefly in some of our previous discussions but a reflection attack or an amplification attack has a general goal of denial of service where I send simply send a flood of information protocol requests packets whatever it might be spoofing the source IP address of that packet so that the packet has the source address of the intended target rather than the source address of the attacker so the uh, the the IP hosts that receive these packets in essence become reflectors uh, and then the reflectors respond by sending those response packets to the spoofed address which is the target uh, which in turn would, would then mean that we're launching that denial of service attack against that particular target flooding that, un, un, that, that unsuspected computer now if the request packets are sent by the attacker uh, uh, and it's sent to lots and lots of hosts or it solicits a large amount of responses this is also considered an amplification attack a smurf attack is exactly what this is uh, where I send a, uh, a PC a TCP excuse me an ICMP echo request from the IP address of 10115 which in this case happens to be the victim and I target the broadcast address of a subnet uh, in turn then that those clients on that network would then send their echo reply to the victim overwhelming that victim with a large amount of data right this is a classic example of a reflection and amplification attack uh, which was uh, used quite a bit in the 1990s most of the network resources today are protected against this type of attack uh, because we have uh, uh, things in place and that have become kind of a de facto standard in network configurations that protect against these types of attacks all right so you're seeing in this diagram here an example of a smurf attack uh, the bandwidth is pretty critical here the attacker has a very small amount of bandwidth a 56k dial-up connection which I guess would have been pretty popular in the 90s but the, the target has a much larger or faster connection a T1 speed so there's no way that a, an attacker would be able to effectively directly attack that client because it doesn't have enough bandwidth or resources to be able to do so so instead we uh, we direct the attack to our DS3 our digital signal 3 connection which operates at 45 megabits per second uh, which can then easily overwhelm that T1 connection with those responses. All right. So the, uh, uh, the iOS, Cisco iOS, uh, is, mitigates these types of attacks because this is what we would refer to as a directed broadcast feature, uh, and directed broadcast traffic is generally no longer allowed uh, in, in networks today. But there are other types of reflection and uh, amplification attacks that exist for example NTP has an application amplification factor of 557 charge in uh, 359 DNS with an application factor of 28 to 54 times SSDP and so on um, now there are in a lot of place uh, in a lot of cases with these particular protocols uh, different things that have to be enabled for example the abuse of NTP requires that an old feature of that protocol is active we use a debug command called monlist to trigger a large amount of data directed to the victim's computer uh, there is no authentication or authorization for this uh, and so on but uh, you know again it's not it's not something that we see very commonly today Please do not confuse reflection and amplification or, or, or uh, assume that they're the same thing. Reflection attacks occur when we forge the source address of the request packet pretending to be the victim. Uh, whereas amplification, the goal is to make the abused service providers, uh, service, excuse me, produce as much response data as possible. The ratio 
between the size of the responses and the request is what we call that amplification factor, right? I mentioned some of them for some of the other protocols. The attacker wants to achieve the largest possible ratio. Say, let's say for an example, if an open charge end service is used to flood a victim, an amplification factor of up to 359 times could be visible in this particular case. ChargeN is not really expected to be used these days. It really shouldn't be a protocol that's utilized. But with these particular techniques, and if they're used together, an attack can be generated. Servers in multiple locations could be involved in producing the devastating results in the network itself. All right. All right. So they are talking specifically about uh, the uh, Smurf attack. Uh, it even says here, Smurf attack no longer poses a threat as it once did. Newer reflection and amplif uh, amplif amplification attacks pose a huge threat. For example, in March of 2013, DNS amplification was used to cause a distributed denial of service attack that made it impossible for anyone to access an organization's website uh, it slowed internet traffic worldwide. The attackers were able to generate up to 300 gigabits a second of, act, of attack traffic by exploiting DNS open recursive resolvers and so on. So just because we don't mention them specifically, there are many different types of reflection and amplification attacks that exist. Which TCP IP protocol can be used in an amplification attack by exploiting the protocol's weakness in a recursive lookup. Uh, well, we just mentioned that, DNS, right? We just talked about that here in this particular case. Now, by definition, a spoofing attack is simply when you try to make yourself appear as somebody else, right? Spoofing attacks uh, are, are called spoofing attacks for that very reason. We're, we're trying to generate and, and coordinate the attack from a spoofed address, whether it's a spoofed IP address, a spoofed MAC address, or even a spoofed application or a spoofed surface uh, service, excuse me. DHCP spoofing is a great example of a spoofed application uh, where I would actually pose as a DHCP server on the network, offering up offer messages and acknowledgments, in the hopes of poisoning DHCP information. I could do the same thing with DNS. I could do the same thing with other applications as well. This figure here illustrates an IP spoofing attack. The attacker is 172.25.9.7, sends a packet to the server at 10.1.2.3, but uses 192.168.6.4 as the source IP address of the packet, the server sends its response to what it believes is the originating host of 192.168.6.4. All right. Another example of a spoofing is a land attack. Uh, now, a land attack, which is a local area network denial attack, is a de uh, denial of service attack that uh, uh, is facilitated by sending special poison spoof packets to a computer to cause it to lock up. The security flaw was actually discovered originally in the mid 90s uh, and um, and has kind of shown up in I wouldn't say recent times, but certainly showed up in the in the early 2000s. But uh, but basically the attack involves sending spoofed TCP send packets, which are connection orientation or connection initiation packets with a targeted host's IP address to open to to an open port. Uh, that we're using with both the source and the destination port. That source and destination port would be the same. This in turn causes the machine to reply to itself continuously, uh, which is obviously going to vastly affect that particular computer. Uh, there have been other land attacks that have been found like SNMP, uh, Windows, uh, Kerberos and Global Services. Uh, and, and mainly because of design flaws in a particular device. Sorry about that. All right. 
All right. So a layer two redirect or a spoofing attack can be referred to as which type of attack? Well, at layer two, we're talking about a MAC address spoofing attack. All right. Uh, now, land attack takes advantage of layer four, TCP port numbers, UDP port numbers. Application would be layer seven. IP addressing would be layer three. DHCP is another protocol, of course, that we use quite a bit in modern networks today. Dynamic host configuration protocol allows us to sign, assign variables to a computer that would allow it to connect and communicate over the network. And there are basically two major forms of DHCP attacks. We have DHCP spoofing attacks and we have DHCP starvation attacks. One is intended to potentially uh, create some sort of man in the middle type of attack where we have what we call DHCP spoofing. Uh, so somebody puts a rogue DHCP server on the network to generate DHCP uh, or, or generate offers to discover messages and then ultimately acknowledgements to reply messages or request messages. Uh, and uh, for the purposes of poisoning information that might be assigned to a client. If I can poison your DNS, I can redirect your DNS traffic or, or uh, re, you know, resolve uh, DNS queries to, to fake sites and whatnot. If I can poison your gateway, I can insert myself into a conversation uh, and so on. So there are ways for me to control how the host communicates if I can poison that DHCP information. So, uh, and, and typically, by the way, when a client sends out a DHCP discover message, it will automatically accept the first offer that it receives, whether that offer is from a legitimate server or not. There really isn't any kind of inherent security built into the protocol itself. It's a basic broadcast-based client-server protocol. Uh, now, we can protect against DHCP attacks, spoofing attacks, by implementing something called DHCP snooping and dynamic ARP inspection. Uh, now we don't necessarily need dynamic ARP inspection to run DHCP snooping, but those two things kind of work together. But DHCP snooping allows me to identify what ports on a network switch can source server traffic. So ports would become trusted or untrusted. Untrusted ports would not allow me to source offers and replies whereas trusted sort ports would allow me to, to source offers and replies. And I can even do some rate limiting uh, to protect against DHCP starvation attacks as well. All right. What is a DHCP starvation attack? Uh, really quite simply, it's an attack against the availability of addresses within, a DH, within the scope of DHCP. Uh, in other words, saying, okay, I'm going to go ahead and issue uh, as many uh, DHCP discover messages as I can uh, so that I can get as many leases as I can over a short period of time with the hope of re using up all of the addresses within the pool. Uh, and that way legitimate clients would then no longer be able to get addressing information. So a starvation attack is really an attack against availability of DHCP services. All right, which option is the, the illegitimate DHCP server that is referred in context to a DHCP server-based attack? Well, the illegitimate DHCP server would be a rogue DHCP server. When somebody goes rogue, they become illegitimate. They're going against the, the, the context of security. So a rogue DHCP server would be a server in this case uh, that is, is not supposed to be on the network and not supposed to be acting as a DHCP server. So let's wrap up this lesson here by going through our summary challenge. Which two statements regarding early TCP IP development are correct? TCP IP was the only network protocol suite available and was developed for internet, uh, internet work environments. That's actually not true. There were actually lots of competing protocols, well, several competing protocols in the early stages. IPX, uh, Apple Talk were two examples. Uh, the focus was on solving the technical challenges of moving information as quickly and reliably as possible 
security was not a concern. Yes, that is very true. In the early days of network communication, these were very limited networks that didn't involve a lot of clients. And on top of that, these were networks that were typically deployed in a secure environment. And as such, security was not as much of a concern because the, these, were, these were essentially isolated networks at the time. So that is true. The model was developed as a flexible fault tolerant set of protocols. Uh, to an extent, yes, especially when you talk about TCP in this particular case, uh, because of the reliability mechanisms and whatnot that were built into TCP. Uh, let's see, the design and architecture of TCP IP has not changed since its adoption in the 1970s. Well, we know that's not true. Which type of an IP attack occurs when an attacker inserts themselves into the communication session and takes over the session? Well, that would be, quite frankly, session hijacking, right? MAC address flooding uh, is a denial of service attack. DHCP depletion is a denial of service attack uh, or a starvation attack. And DOS is just a generic description of uh, a particular type of attack. But denial of service prevents availability but does not affect integrity or uh, confidentiality, okay? All right, which two types of attacks are examples of ICMP denial of service attacks? Blooming onion attack, uh, we didn't mention that one. Um, it is a type of attack, but it is not an example of an ICMP attack. I'm not even sure if that's actually really a type of attack. Uh, it seems like it would be a good name for a type of attack, but it isn't in our case. ICMP flood attack, of course, that is a denial of service attack through ICMP. DHCP depletion attack is not related to ICMP. Uh, neither is a DHCP whale attack, which again is not really a type of attack with DHCP, but a Smurf attack is definitely an ICMP related type of attack. Which phase of the TCP communication process is attacked during the TCP SYN flood? Uh, that would be the three-way handshake. Uh, not connection established. There really is no such thing as a connection established phase uh, or connection closed or connection reset. Those are all functions of TCP, but the three-way handshake is the actual description of the process of establishing that TCP communication. What are two options, which two are options uh, or examples of UDP-based attacks? Uh, SYN flood would not be this case, right? Because that would require TCP SYN, SYN ACK ACK. SQL Slammer, we talked about that one specifically. Also UDP flooding attacks, we talked about that one specifically. MAC address flooding is layer two. IP flooding is layer three. Which option describes an attack vector? The resolution of an attack, the result of or damage from an attack, a path, a method, or a route by which an attack was carried out. Uh, and that would be the correct answer in this case. That is the attack vector. The last stage of an attack, of the attack continuum. Last stage of an attack continuum is basically to maintain access and hide your tracks, right? What is the example of, what is an example of a reconnaissance attack tool that will cycle through all well-known ports to provide a complete list of all the services they're running on the hosts? NetUse, IPconfig, show run, or Nmap? Well, port scanning is a function of a network mapper. And that's what Nmap is in this particular case. All right. Which two options are software vulnerability scanners? Uh, VMstat, Nessus, Fingerprint, OpenVAS, or Cisco Firepower DNS? Uh, Nessus would be one, as well as OpenVAS would be the second one in this list. Which two options are examples of password cracking tools? Kane Enable and John the Ripper would be two very, very popular uh, password cracking tools. Which technique would an attacker utilize in order to have 
clients send packets to the wrong gateway. We can do an ICP, ICMP redirect, or we can do ARP poisoning. Those would be the two methods that we would use in this case. DNS would only allow application layer redirection uh, and reflection and amplification are attacks for denial of service. Which statement describes a denial of service attack? Uh, it uh, poses a legitimate software or email attachment in order to launch a malicious attack when open. That would be virus or malware. Can steal data like usernames and passwords. Again, denial of service attacks do not try to gain access to information. They try to uh, uh, attack availability, not confidentiality or integrity. Rarely seen because denial of, denial of service attacks are extremely difficult to engineer. It's actually the opposite of that. Denial of service attacks are extremely easy to engineer. Uh, attempts to consume all critical computer network resources to make it unusable. Yep, that is an attack against availability. Which type of an attack occurs when an attacker spoofs the IP address of a victim sending continuous stream of small requests which produce a continuous stream of much larger replies that are sent to the victim's IP address. That would definitely be the description of an amplification attack. Okay. Which type of spoofing attack uses fake source IP addresses that are different than their real IP addresses? Uh, well, that would be IP spoofing. That's the whole point. Uh, we're spoofing an IP address. And finally, which two attacks can be caused by a rogue DHCP server? Uh, let's see, denial of service? Eh, probably not. Well, I, maybe, potentially, definitely man in the middle. There's no doubt about that because I can change a gateway or I can change DNS. But at the same time, I guess that would also include denial of service because I could give out fake gateway information or fake DNS information, which would then in turn make the, could, could make the computer unusable. Um, the rest don't really apply in this case. All right. So we'll go ahead and wrap up this lesson. We'll see you guys in the next lesson describing common network application attacks.